Buenos días y bienvenidos. Good morning and welcome to the second day of the Digital Coin and European Financial System Civil Virtual Summit. In the four roundtable discussions and interventions we will have today, we will deal with very interesting and relevant topics related to digital coins and crypto assets regulation as key to the sustainability of the new financial system, security as key for the development of digital currencies, geopolitics and large digital currencies, and also technology at the service of monetary transformation, which is the title of the first round table discussion. It is a pleasure to welcome Iñaki Garay. He is the deputy director of the economic newspaper Expansion. He will introduce the participants of this round table discussion. Thank you for your participation and welcome. Muy buenos días a todos. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this roundtable discussion about technology at the service of monetary transformation. I would like to thank all the attendees and especially the participants of this panel. And I will uh, introduce all of them now. I, before, I would like to introduce this topic. We live in a world with deep changes where technologies and hyperconnectivity are establishing the path for transformation. We are changing our ways of production. We can speak about the industry for uh, 0.0, our ways to consume, mainly due to the recent pandemic where we couldn't go out and we had to consume in different ways. We're possibly even changing our ways to love. And today, which is our topic today, our ways to pay. It's been for some years we could see a gentleman with a, a stack of notes and now they are paying with their mobile phones. We have new products such as cryptocurrencies, which are now uh, being more and more relevant, which are still uh, at the side of the traditional system and a side of the traditional standards and regulations, which are clearly now obsolete with this new reality. The question that is opening this panel is whether the digital currency is going to be a daily reality. I have my personal perception, but I would, of course, love to have the perceptions of all the experts. In my first question, after or behind this revolution, there's a lot of work to be done if we do not want this to be a total mess. Uh, of course, we need a technology base, and the experts will illustrate us on that, of course, and also regulation and many more things that I'm sure our experts will clarify that are uh, today members of this panel. First, we have Juan Luis Encinas. He is the general manager of Iberpay. Good morning, Juan Luis. Juan Luis is systems engineer by at the Diusto University, at the BS uh, Business School, master's degree. He has 25 years experience as executive manager in payments. Iberpay uh, manages the payments, the digital payments between um, the different systems in Spain with the SEPA payments, uh, with a technology basis used with innovative services such as Bizum, which we all know. Iberpay leads since 2019 the experiments and concept tests of the Spanish banks related to the digital euro and with the immediate payments that can be programmed with smart contracts, with smart, uh, blockchain and the Internet of Things. We will speak about the digital euro with Juan Luis. Secondly, we have Jose Manuel Fernandez Oliva, his partner company director of the Common Management Solutions. Good morning. Good morning. He's an engineer with more than 30 years' experience in the technology sector. Currently, he's a partner in Common for the development of the banking business. He was also founding member of Deloitte and a partner in KPMG and also 
uh, in technology for Hewlett Packard. So welcome, Jose Manuel. We have Jose Manuel Guardia Well. She is the general manager of Alastria. She is engineer in telecommunications and masters in business with more than 22 years experience in managing areas such as uh, operations and technologies and leading projects for transformation and launching new products in different multinational companies with services such as oil and gas, bank, uh, banking and insurance. And she's tried to generate bridges between startups and multinational companies. Throughout her professional career, he's been leading many different multicultural uh, working groups. Uh, her CB would be really very long, so I am going to summarize her um, her position now. She works for Alastria, a uh, not-for-profit organization, which is gathering many different large, uh, medium, and small companies, fostering digital economy through the uh, technology of decentralized, decentralized systems and blockchain. We also have Julio Faura. He is founder and CEO of Adara. He's been working for more than 25 years between the technology world and the financial systems world. And his main focus today is the assets, the digital assets, and the blockchain technology in the financial industry. Julio started his career as a designer of microchips, and he's been playing a leading role in the banking sector. He joined Santander Bank, where he was uh, leading investment banking and consumer finance. and operations technologies, and in his last time in Santander, he led the R&D department within the bank, launching and leading every activity related to cryptocurrencies and the blockchain technology. Since uh, mid-July in 2018, he's a founding member of Adara, uh, which is a platform that issues uh, CBDCs in real time for uh, banking institutions, corporations, and central banks. He is uh, engineering telecommunications, PhD at the University of Madrid and Master's in Technology and the MIT. And then we have Leif Ferreira. He is an entrepreneur from Valencia. Uh, even if he's very young, he's 15 years of experience in this sector of technology. I think this is a basic rule. You have all been for a long time in this sector, but you are all very young at the same time. So he's, he has 15 years of experience in uh, information technology. He's expert in what he defines as the guts of the cryptocurrencies and the use of the blockchain technology, which is an element that uh, comes over and over again. Leif Ferreira is founder and CEO of Bit2Me. Bit2Me was born in 2014. He has more than 100 uh, workers uh, with the support of Carpentier. He, he has had a uh, a great expansion and a great speed, uh, which also reflects the speed of this world. He's been awarded internationally uh, with uh, market solutions, awards, etc. I could go on and on, but the important thing here is that you are all being introduced. So I welcome you, and I will first ask you one question, which I told you uh, somehow in my introduction. We're going to be speaking about digital currency and whether it is going to be um, a daily currency that we can use on our daily life. Can you summarize this in three concepts, three concepts for the keys for this transformation we're already experiencing? In order to start, I would like to give the floor to Juan Luis Encinas. All right, thank you very much, Iñaki, and good morning, everybody. I would first like to speak about three main keys in this digital transformation of uh, currencies of money. First is immediate transfers, which you've already mentioned before. Immediate transfers is a revolution that is transforming digital payments as of today. The regulations 
uh, for services such as Bison is already changing the way we pay uh, for beers or a dinner at the weekend. As a second concept, I would be speaking about the programmability of money and payments, which is an important concept. I believe it is very interesting in this transformation. We speak about the possibility of programming the payments with software codes or lines with smart contracts in blockchain networks with different conditions that you can establish and that trigger the payments. And as a third concept, I would be speaking about, which is important in the medium term, the digital currencies uh, supported by central banks, which is the CBDCs, which is the response of the central banks to all this revolution of cryptocurrencies by the private sector. And in CBDC, in the euro area, of course, the, the digital euro, which we will speak about later. Thank you very much, Juan Luis. I would now like to uh, know your opinion, uh, Juan Luis, about whether you believe that the cryptocurrencies uh, are already a reality. And of course, it is a reality. I am going to mention some aspects regarding regulation, the components of uh, to prevent money laundering, which are associated to the STEMS world, what is the impact they are going to have, and mainly on the technology side of things, because technology needs to support the reporting of this to the regulator. And it needs to strongly support on artificial intelligence systems and big data applications. So I am going to tell you some examples during this conference so that I can illustrate these components. All right. Pepe, it's a pleasure. Now, Monse, we would like to hear your opinion about this reality of digital currency. Yes, I will speak about the three main components, which uh, the first would be um, everything revolving the regulation, but from the point of view of innovation, we have the need to um, understand this revolution with a different point of view. There's a transformation. The second point would be economy, because we need to speak about monetary policy and exchange uh, or interchange rates. How does it all fit in, in the, how can we can work with the exchange and if we, this is necessary? And the final one would be the innovation the mixture between the blockchain and artificial intelligence or the Internet of Things. There's a convergence of all these technologies that is necessary in order to progress in a future platform. Julio, can you give us your vision briefly? Well, I, I believe we have to first clarify the discussion because we tend to mix things up sometimes. So first, the money is already digital. 98% of the money in the world which we are using on a daily basis when we pay with our credit card or with immediate payments that we have thanks to Juan Luis and others is already digital because they are banking balances, but it is not accessible. It is not so accessible because they need to go through bank APIs. And when we speak about digital currencies, this is a technology status that um, makes them more accessible to everybody. So I believe one of the keys would be to see to what extent can the technology help us to make it more accessible and programmable without changing the regulatory framework. We are thinking about, um, if we think about changing the nature of the money, I have serious doubts because if the money is going to be created by the central banks, well, this is a problem because we have to redefine the role of the banks. And I believe that one of the keys would be to continue 
keeping the current order in order to make it all work. Otherwise, we would need to define a new framework so that all the players can have a new framework. So this is also associated to uh, one of the things that Juan Luis has mentioned, because these are things that are already working. We already have instant payment. Everything is already working fine, mainly in Europe. And in emerging countries, maybe not so much, but when we try to globalize and we think about global transactions, it is much more complicated because there isn't any global regulation for that. There isn't a, a supra country for that. So progressing in this regulatory framework is difficult because there isn't any political unity here. So that's one of the keys. How can you create a global uh, regulation? I think that's difficult from the political perspective. Thank you. Now, Leif, you have the floor. I fully agree with what Julio Faura has just said. Of course, money is already digital. It's true that uh, it's a bit of a Frankenstein because it's uh, established on an analogical basis with certain pieces. It is not 100% programmable and accessible. It doesn't have these fundamental pillars, which I consider so important, which we may have in other scenarios, such as the cryptocurrencies, which were already born with that. But they are, we are confronting the liquid expectations of the users, that is, um, making things immediately, such as the immediate transfers, with what Julio was saying, regulation. It is very complex to have a regulation that is standardized at global level or around the galaxy, we could even say. It is really difficult to do so and to make these two models coexist. So I believe that I could um, mention two pillars that may be fundamental, maybe for the for a single money that there should be, but for a parallel money, which should be free, free to access. It is very important that this money is free to access, that it is issued on a decentralized basis, and that it does not depend on a government. We need some kind of money that is not manipulated or managed or controlled by any specific government above any other country, which is happening as of today with, for example, the dollar and with other currencies. And I think it's important that in, a, in the planet where we're living in, we see there are um, situations being impacted because of political decisions in this sense. So we need an alternative kind of money. And along these lines, we need open source. I believe there should be a money that would care about the privacy of the users because we are really not aware about the huge number of processes through big data and through and all the information that you can receive from uh, transactions. You never know uh, who can have that information. If you are homosexual in some countries, uh, you may be punished for that, and transactions give a lot of information about you. So we need to take care about the privacy of the users, and this is something the governments have never done. So let's hope this could be achieved. We believe we can do so. We have cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, and I believe this should be coexisting in parallel and so that the users can choose freely which kind of money to use. Thank you very much, Leif. We will now speak, or we will later speak about the privacy perspective and the coexistence between traditional money and cryptocurrencies. To start with my second question, I would like to uh, ask some questions to Juan Luis, which he has already mentioned in the beginning. I would like you to tell us about the immediate transfers. How is it working? Either are they safe? What is the regulation they use? And then to start with the digital euro, how is it progressing? What is it? 
really? And what kind of advantages can we have? How is it going to be issued and distributed? Can you give us some hints about it? All right, thank you. In terms of immediate transfers, as Julio and Leif said, digital money is already there, is already existing, and is moving at a great speed, at an extreme speed. These are the immediate transfers. Immediate transfers are, they, they move from a current account, is money moving from one current account to another, and they are made in a question of seconds. In the case of Spain, it is 0 0.80 seconds to move funds between two current accounts. And they are available 24 hours, seven days a week. So, uh, this is opposed to the time it took with traditional transfers. These immediate transfers are the technology and regulatory basis of services such as BASIN, which is transforming the way we pay in Spain every day. I compare this with the 5G of payments. This is like in the telecommunications um, would be uh, the 5G, zero latency. This is a European payment scheme, that is, it is complying uh, the EU regulations, and they are common for the Euro payment area, which is the SEPA. It is more than 4,000 banks and 500,000 uh, uh, 500, citizens, and we've been working with that for four years, and Spain is leading the deployment of these immediate transfers. We're doing so because we are the second country in the Euro area in the in volume of operations of immediate transfers. We are having one million immediate transfers every day, 262 million last year, and the most significant data is that in Spain, every 100 transfers 35 are already immediate transfers, and this compares to an average uh, in Europe, which is around 8%. So this is the most significant data we can provide about our leadership. And in terms of security, it follows the most advanced security standards uh, requested by the reinforced authentication, the double identification uh, authentication factor. So, of course, they are safe, they are secure in terms of the digital euro and how it is progressing. The most important milestone took place in October last year when the central bank, the European Central Bank, reported on the digital euro because this meant a turning point regarding uh, CBDCs, the digital currencies supported by the central bank. It's like uh, the beginning of a roadmap towards the digital euro. It's a movement that almost all the central banks are taking around the world. Uh, China may have the most advanced regulation, but also the US, Russia. It is in general. Um, already existing around the world. Now we are at a stage with the European Central Bank with a testing stage. We are having concept tests. And in this stage, we are trying to test all design options. They are now open to any options without discarding anyone. We are uh, analyzing all the potential use cases, all the risks about issuing a digital euro, because it, of course, entails certain important risks, but also the threats that um, if they materialize, could accelerate the issue of the digital euro. So by the end of this year, uh, by the mid, the mid of the, the half of this year, in a couple of months, the central bank will take a next step about the digital euro, which may be the pilot project stage or something that is more specific, closing the different design options that are now absolutely open. So if we decide uh, how the digital euro is going to be, now everything is quite open. But it is true that the European Central Bank says that the digital euro is absolutely 
um, the same as a euro from the legal point of view, as a note or a coin, but in a digital format. It is like an electronic format of a money issued by the European Central Bank, which is open and accessible to every citizen and to every company. It is not replacing cash. This is something they insist on. It is complementary and it is going to coexist with cash. And the goal, the purpose of the central bank in Europe is to make it a means of payment and not an investment, a financial investment. It tries to avoid accumulation of digital euro and it is going to promote a use which is similar to cash, that is for general uh, small amounts, uh, small amount payments. The European Central Bank has guaranteed that even issuing the digital euro, it is going to guarantee the access to coins and notes with the same um, with the same ease uh, as, as is today. But we can see that in some countries there are already difficulties to access cash by some sectors of the population, such as rural areas, and because of the low use of the cash, because, because due to the pandemic it was even more reduced. So the digital euro will facilitate money that is issued from the European Central Bank that is easily accessible when it is difficult to access notes or coins. Some advantages of the digital euro, well, I've told you some of them. It is an alternative or a complement to cash but much more efficient in economic terms. Let's imagine that the cost to produce, to distribute, to issue, to withdraw, to recycle cash can mean several tenths of the GDP in a country. The, the digital uh, currencies had, have much lower uh, environmental impact. It is going to foster economic inclusion or inclusiveness for certain sectors. It will help us to make payments without internet, without being online because right now this is not very easy and the digital euro, one of the characteristics they are analyzing is to make offline payments with it, the uh, possibility to program payments that is very important for the Internet of Things because payments can be done uh, with uh, software, with smart contracts, where not people, but maybe the things in the Internet of Things can really make a payment that is a program payment in the network of the Internet of Things. Is there a room for improvement in the digital euro? Yes, but it requires a prior design of all these um, digital currencies in the central banks in an interoperate, interoperational way. And this is something that needs to be done before the, the digital euro is issued. And now regarding distribution and issues, issuance, well, issuance will always be by the central bank. And what we see is that it seems that the distribution model is going to be supported on a public-private collaboration with sectorial infrastructures that pay a similar role to the cash. When it comes out from the factory of the central bank, there's a distribution chain of this money, which goes through the financial sector and regulate, regulatory uh, institutions or uh, ever pay, and the digital euro may have follow a similar uh, model with regulated intermediaries that are supervised and, of course, authorized. So I think I've already answered all the questions. Yes, of course, we will come back to that topic later because there's a project about smart money, and I would like you to tell us a bit more about it later and what are the implications uh, 
uh, of the digital euro in the monetary policy. We will now give the floor to Jose Manuel to ask him about the need of a regulation to prevent money laundering in order to establish all the regulatory procedures in buying cryptocurrencies. I would also like to you to tell us what are the processes for securing the identity, what are the regulation uh, requests by the exchanges. Yes, of course, Iñaki. Of course, it's necessary to have a European regulation to prevent money laundering. The president of the central bank, Christine Lagarde, asked uh, for regulation since the very beginning because it is an asset that may generate high speculation. However, currency currently, cryptocurrencies have different characteristics uh, in different currency and countries. First, the exchanges would need need authorization to operate with a regulation that guarantees the identification of customers and the traceability of the operations. This is fundamental. We are already taking the first steps so that this can happen in Spain. From that point, in the market, we may be able to operate with bitcoins and cryptocurrencies in regulated markets and in non-regulated markets. Some of them may have with certain level of trust and some others would have a lower level of trust. Therefore, if the price of the Bitcoin is currently in the non-regulated market a bubble, its regulation will determine its price and its trend because there will be huge uh, amounts of operations that are regulated that will generate trust and the convergence of these two factors will adjust the market. So I do consider that the trust would be in the long term, the volatility of the Bitcoin operations would be lower and the opportunities for investment will increase. All right. In the processes for securitization, we need a, a digital identity, such as blockchain. This is a mechanism to provide a proof of the identity. Thanks to face biometry, we can provide this identification with any device. So, in the information registered in blockchain, we have the hash. It's never, it never includes personal information and it generates security certified by blockchain and you are complying with privacy issues. Furthermore, exchange will need to provide the traceability of operations of the customer to comply with the law 2010 around prevention of laundering and uh, fi laundering financial and also the royal decree of the 28th of April which passes the fifth directive in Spain and this uh, makes a ledger of providers of service of crypto coins with this ledger this registry for the first time in Spain regulates the um, change operations of virtual or digital coin and the escrow also uh, developed by exchanges. And exchanges need to prepare themselves to operate with crypto coins in processes of analysis and identity uh, with the due license processes, which they do not comply yet, and classify clients in uh, risk levels, establish traceability processes, the client screening, all these type of processes that are already developed in the banking system but need to be a bit more developed. These are the processes that we need to follow in terms of regulation, uh, the, ex the requirements that exchange need to cover to develop all these operations. Thank you very much, Pepe. Now, Monse, I would like to ask you which needs to be the framework uh, for all these changes, if there will be a standard norm I'm sure that you all have an idea around this concept, this norm. And also the digital transformation is not only using the tools, but also learning. I would like you to tell us a bit more around the learning process. Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah. If we, when we speak about regulation, we're speaking about digitalization of money, and we also speak about monetary and banking economical regulation, but we also need to speak about a technological regulation. 
we in technology uh, rely on the normative standardization of technologies norms and what we should work on right now is in this norm around digital identity processes or processes of interchange of exchange both in this sense uh, have the need a higher need of a methodology not all regulation as we have uh, spoken about before all, all banking regulation and also the, uh, the laundering or the requirements we can have with exchange. All this without new regulation for technologies in IT, for example, in cyber security, in how to create these uh, tracing processes, then we will enter into the problem of privacy that Leib was speaking about. So we need to make a hybrid in the norm, not only the banking and economical normative norms, but also the digital one. And that's the starting point for the learning. The fact that this distributed network technology is already having uh, high rates, uh, high speeds in terms of technology, but in terms of understanding uh, from the point of view of the customer or the person operating with this coin, with this digital money, uh, backed by the central bank or not, then we should have this uh, capability of providing information and training around what's changing, what's different from an instant transfer, the current instant transfer, and the difference between that and what will be in in the crypto world, what changes that's a crypto in the, in the sense of the global interchange or exchange, and this cannot be instant. It cannot be only uh, centered in experts on banking and economy and financial regulation, but we also need to work with uh, technology experts in technology. And I think the European Commission is work, ha making a good job in this sense, in the area, the general area of regulatory framework in terms of technology. They're working together with the banking areas and also the different organization establishing the exchanges in money. There, we still need to work for some years in these two perspectives, these two views, uh, to understand properly what this change is. Thank you, Monse. I would like to ask Julio. Uh, from the conversation that I had with you, I, underst I understood a couple of concepts, but I would like you to tell us what differences you consider that are the most questionable and why is it important to advance in standardization of technology? What advances are we seeing in terms of standardization? Well, I was saying, of course, uh, that it's important to clarify this debate, this discussion, because we tend to confuse things. On the one side, we have crypto coins, cryptos, and mainly Bitcoin, which is the crypto coin, cryptocurrency. Maybe you have a different opinion, but I think Bitcoin is a digital asset which has a value like gold, like digital or gold. It's the digital gold. It's an asset that it does not back anything. It's not a digital representation of money, of bank banking money, for example. It's not a security, for example. It doesn't have any intrinsic value. And it's impossible to regulate. You cannot have regulation in the sense that it's just an asset for a community, within a community. And you cannot use it for nothing else. You can use it for payments and things like that, but it's there are other things like digital coin are much more functional. But sometimes we speak about tokenized money. Tokenized money is the idea of creating digital representations of other money other that's already existing, existed. And 
someone takes money, for example, money from a customer, puts it in a bank account, and then issues these tokens, which is a digital representation of money. So that this digital representation of money is backed one-to-one -one with the money which is kept in the bank. In that sense, token is backed, and at any moment you can transfer it, you can pay with it, and afterwards you can recover your, your real money, the one saved in the bank. Both things are different. First one does not have regulation. We can regulate whether people buy it or not. Yes, we can do it. In the same way that you can regulate uh, gold, for example, you pay taxes, but the nature of the, the asset is very different. And in the second case, in the tokenized money, it is an asset. And we have banking regulation for digital or electronic money from the central banks, which are the ones issuing the money. And in that case, tokenized money, we're speaking about a different way, a different technological base using a different technological base to create money as we know it. So it's much less necessary to advance, go forward in terms of normative frameworks because we already have them. And when you buy a prepay card in the United States, for example, or for example in PayPal, or for example a card from La Caixa, this is already electronic money, digital money, and we already have a regulation for that, and we can do it on any other uh, database or ledger. So the difference is important. Another important thing to understand is that when we create digital electronic money, we're already using a normative framework, regulatory framework that's existing, and we're not changing anything. And when a bank does this, and JP Morgan Coin, for example, uh, we do this type of coins for big banks. This is banking money. It's already created in a bank account. And what happens is that we are making it accessible around a decentralized network. And you can add uh, some behavior due to smart contrast. So we're doing something different, but we're not changing its own nature. This is good because it doesn't change the monetary policy. It doesn't change the way the world functions, the role of central bank banks. It doesn't change anything. It's important to understand that because if we uh, start using this type of uh, banking assets issued by a central bank or a decentralized network, things change. And the last thing I wanted to say is that we're speaking much about CBDCs, the digital coins backed by central banks. We already have tokenized uh, structures or constructions here, and they are researching on non-tokenized constructions. For example, a central bank issuing directly the coin over a decentralized network. It is important to understand which is the uh, Majorist use and the minorist uh, use. The majorist use platforms that they're going to uh, the money that banks are going to use. The digital money from central banks is already exists. It's called PTGS in La Fe, for example, RTGS in the England Bank. All these things already exist, and only banks have access to that. And I think it should stay that way because otherwise the world will, will change very much. We need to make it more accessible to work 24-7 and also to provide an international access in other entities that do not have representation in the central bank. But we, if we speak about a retail CBDC, that means people having money issued directly by the central bank. They're researching on this, they're speculating on this, and the main uh, point is that the nature of money changes and also the role of banks. And 98% of money nowadays is banks uh, and credits. You buy a mortgage, the bank creates the mortgage and creates the money in your balance. It, he creates. That's 98% of the money. If we change this, we need to be very sure about it. 
then I don't know how it will work. Because we, if we change this model, the main question will be, what will be the role of the bank? That's a good question, yes. So, and also, will the central bank do it? I don't think so. So this question is very, it's a key question. Well, thank you, Julio. We will come back to this, but for, for Leif, I wanted to ask him how the digital transactions are evolving, and I would like you to tell us what role are they, do they have, and what crypto, uh, what role crypto has, and what problems can we face with these transactions, and what advantages they have. Leif. You have the floor. Well, I believe that we from the platform are seeing it very clear because in the end, other, you were speaking about the evolution of 2019 to 2020, 1,200% uh, evolution. In this year, we follow the same growth rate. It's representative of what's happening, and it's difficult to determine how many people are using cryptos. We can make calculations. In Spain, I would say it would be 10%. It's just a calculation. It's impossible to know due to its decentralized nature. And nowadays, crypto coins, cryptocurrencies, it's important to say the crypto that is here for the most time is Bitcoin. With Bitcoin, the revolution was born. And this has been a revolution, a real revolution, because much innovation has been streamlined from conservative elements such as central banks, for example. They have under they underwent this digital transformation. This is a catalyzer and requires an acknowledgement. And we need to understand that uh, besides all this time, Bitcoin is a software. It's in its 0 0.22 version. Uh, it's 0 0.21, and they're developing 0 0.22. It has not reached 1.0. And in IT, we all know that a software that has not still reached 1.0 is a B software. So we are generating, or it's being generated by people from the whole world. Some of the best, greatest brains are working on this type of technology in a very altruistic way. This is uh, very important. And this money is a startup, so to say. Is Where is it leading? Well, it's not more than a social, technological, economical experiment where many and many ingredients are converging in order to create something that I believe has a lot of potential. But there is much speculation. The main pillars are very interesting. Let's see where it leads and what other transformations or use cases around it uh, it will create. Julio has said before something that I liked very much and it is that we tend to confuse things. I say this very much, and it's if you cannot convince them, it's just a sentence. If you cannot convince them, just confuse them. It's important to be clear, to be frank, to be honest, transparent, without any prejudice, without owing anything to anyone. And I believe we are now experiencing a turning point in the middle of a crisis, a world crisis, and we can come out of this crisis with innovation and technology development. I don't think it will be good saying, if we change this, we need to reconfigure, reconfigure many things, redesign many things. No, we live in a world which is constantly evolving, and right now we're experiencing a crucial moment, and I think from this crisis, we will uh, create very important digital transformations. Juan Luis has said before that you're a digital. It needs to be digital, of course. It needs to be programmable, open. And this money already exists. 
And for a long time in the world of cryptocurrencies and without volatility, the stable coins, there are some cryptocurrencies which can be transferred and they speak the blockchain uh, language with the transparent and programmable protocol and they're not volatile. I'm speaking about crypto coins like DAI, for example. They do not even have a collateral in fiat in euros issued by central banks. And we're paying taxes, the whole society, to develop something that already exists. And I should not forget this. I wanted to say that Euro Digital, as yuan, the digital yuan being developed in China or other cryptocurrencies being developed in other countries, opens the door for the absolute control of the citizen. We need to have this uh, in mind. They will be able to uh, refrain or restrict payments if you do not comply with the ideology of the person in power. And, um, Yes, the digital currency is a startup, but we never know what government we will have in the future, not us and neither our kids. Well, I have, in the best case, uh, best case scenario, have 50 years in front of me, but afterwards, what will happen? I don't know. I don't think we should work in con control tools. We need to work for a free money, free coin, not a money that uh, makes us slaves. They say money gives power. Imagine what power you have by controlling that that gives you power. We need to be aware of this, we citizens, and decide what money to back. I don't think it should be one or the other. I think they should live together because use cases in the planet, well, this is not a, a IT program with limited variables where you can predict everything. Uh, maybe in some cases uh, one coin is interesting, the other coin is not, but the cit we citizens need to be aware of it. Thank you very much, Leib. We still have 12, 13 minutes for a third round. If you want to make a comment, you can do it, but I'm going to ask Juan Luis Encinas, can you explain us what the proof of concept of smart money consists on, and also what implications can EuroDigital have in the monetary policy policy and financial stability. Well, regarding the smart money initiative that we're doing in Iberpay, the main objective is to prepare the industry for the launching of Euro Digital in the future and to follow the roadmap that the central bank, European Central Bank has uh, provided. What we're doing is a proof of concept of the distribution of this Euro Digital from the central bank to the citizen and the user, the end user of the Euro Digital. We're testing the distribution chain of Euro Digital under a theoretical model of distribution of this Euro Digital, where the European Central Bank relies on these sectorial infrastructures regulated for this function. We need to analyze it in the future, but we're preparing for that possible scenario. We're doing the proofs of concept in a blockchain network uh, cross banking uh, with 17 Spanish banks. Also, the Bank of Spain is participating as observer. And this blockchain, we already have Euro Digital simulated Euro uh, coins, Euro Digital coins, and we simulate. Um, uh, measures uh, uh, used towards banks, for example, or any other authority authorized to distribute this Euro digital. And also, we're proving the retail towards end users where they have wallets to download the Euro digital. We're testing all options of design that the Central European Bank. Uh, has. We're testing almost everything. We're testing the tokenized model and the other model based on um, accounts. And we're testing both models, Euro, tokenized Euro Digital. We're testing an, uh, the Anonymous uh, model and all types of design that the central bank, European Central Bank has. And as end result, we will issue a report, sectorial report. And regarding risks, this is a very interesting topic. And Julio and Leif have spoken about risks and threats, and it is a critical aspect in this analysis 
in this analysis of the European Central Bank, well, they are concerned about losing their main role in the monetary policy and the financial stability. So in the case of a massive implementation of this euro digital, for, for example, the coin of Facebook at international level would generate a chaos, so to say, in terms of financial stability and in terms of monetary policy. It would have, it would be in, also in relation to a digital currency, it would make central banks to lose control of this monetary policy, which is basic for important questions such as the control. And also the issuing of euro digital can generate risks in terms of monetary policy and financial stability. For example, if it's an asset very interesting for the citizens and they um, accumulate this euro digital, there can be a movement uh, of banking accounts towards this euro digital and this would generate a great problem in, this, in the industry, in the sector. What tools can a central bank have to manage this in a CBC, in euro digital? For example, there are several parameters that are being tested right now. Some can be limiting the use. So it's focused more to payments of low price, low amount, also positive interest rates to incentivize or de-incentivize, but the main objective of Euro Digital should be payments and low amount payments. What is a bit scary is that it is a value deposit because then all these risks can become true in the monetary policy and it blocks the transmission of the monetary policy from the central bank to the citizens. There is another risk which has to do with the international use of Euro Digital. There seems to be a race between central banks to see who's the first issuing their digital currency, and this can provoke these different speeds and that there is a use of this Euro digital and create a different monetary area, and this could generate tensions. So uh, an important design for Euro digital is the policy uh, towards the use of non-European citizens, and it's also key the design of the digital yuan or other digital currencies. So in principle, the idea is that it can be used by uh, citizens outside this monetary area, but maybe in a context of tourism, or in the context of, of use in this precise uh, area. But the different monetary regions at international level are very efficient in, term, in terms of payments, in terms of currency, in terms of digital coins. And when we speak about interoperability from the different monetary areas, we find the opposite. International payments between the different monetary areas which have different regulations, different standards, it's a bit of a pain right now. And that's, there's much to do in this, uh, in this direction. So we have five minutes left, so I'm going, I would like to ask Jose Manuel how the AI in artificial intelligence systems can work in regulation and can help in regulation. Well, artificial intelligence try to learn the behavior between operations and to understand the indicators regarding customers. They can, uh, they can provide a wrong valuation or evaluation of a customer. For example, this is important. Which are the main motivations of corporations to begin in this World, well, two components, uh, profitability and business opportunity. And I will give a 
an example, very clear example. For example, nowadays there are insurances having portfolios with uh, high interest and they need to compensate this interest with financial instruments with very low profitability and in the market they do not have ways of compensating it. Why not investing in crypto coins to balance all these portfolios? I'm sure the insurance companies will be interested in this and I give the word to give the floor to Monse because maybe she can say something around it. I want to say what can be the balance between innovation and risk management in terms of digital coin? Well, I think all this we've been spoken, speaking about and uh, what Jose Manuel has just said, well, the truth is that still there are portfolios in a very interesting aspect in the current world of uh, financial systems and insurance systems and that should allow us to innovate because, as Leif said, we have before us this big opportunity of new softwares which are not closed, are open softwares. There is still not a 1.0 version, so it's still under construction with a very big workforce, programmers and people involved. Yeah. So this is something remarkable. We're going to experience changes at international level. And if we're not able to manage and say this is open innovation, and therefore there is risk, and we do not analyze this risk as an opportunity instead of as a barrier, well, the problem we will have is geopolitical for, because other cultures that have more, uh, they have the capability of managing risk as an opportunity, they will be able to work in this area of crypto in a faster way than we have in Europe. And I need to highlight the fact that Diem is, all, is not in Switzerland. They are now operating in the United States where they have a new view of uh, cryptos. So I think in Asia, in the East, and also in the Western world, we need to work to keep innovating in Europe Europe and cross bridges to give uh, profitability. I'm, I agree with Jose Manuel and see what opportunities, new opportunities we have around this technology. Thank you very much, Monse. Now, Julia, very briefly, what are the applications that are now being implemented in order to make these financial assets more advanced? Well, the first applications, or at least those that are that are now starting to be real are financial apps and using tokenized money. The first uh, forms of money for the retail and these are all digital. This is at the, on the regulated market, which is where I believe it's more interesting in a decentralized world. There's a lot of movement around this, which is about creating a financial industry that is parallel to the traditional one and using assets that are unregulated or just half regulated. So it is really exciting. There's a great uh, ability to innovate. But if we do not um, progress on a regulatory framework, it is going to be difficult to work on that. I also wanted to very briefly answer to some of the things that Leif said. Citizens are already under control because 98% of the money is in the hands of the banks. So. <laughs> But also because of the mobile phones, right? Because that's hyper-connectivity. Because if you want to steal something, you have to leave your phone at home. Well, it's true that it has a cost. But security is at the expense of privacy. So we need to think whether we want to water the tree of, pri the, of security with the blood of uh, privacy, that's very important. It's true that in other 
states in emerging countries uh, controlling the citizens is a problem, and but I believe that it is not the case in our economies. And then financing terrorism, if we are doing it in order to avoid the control of certain governments, we will have a problem which is financing terrorism. And banks have spent so much money, the central banks, etc., have spent so much money. And at least part of the society believe uh, we cannot go back here because the world won't be a good place if we can't control this. Very interesting. Leif, I couldn't um, leave this opportunity um, Without asking you about the eruption of Elon Musk with a whole discussion on cryptocurrencies saying first that Tesla would assume the, or would start using bitcoins, now they are taking steps back. I would like you to uh, give us your vision on this and how this impacted the industry. Of course, it's been the case of the week because Elon Musk is... Uh, has uh, millions of followers uh, in Twitter, so no matter what he says, he could smash any company around the world. And if this company has short liquidity in the market, it may have great volatility. Bitcoin is an international system that is relatively small, so um, it doesn't have so much liquidity. It's uh, a long way ahead of it. And Elon Musk has a lot of impact. Some consider him a hero or a person at least who gave us the opportunity to buy bitcoins at a lower price. Others say, well, I did have bitcoins and now they are devaluated. So, well, some people are here because of speculation, but it's true that the world of cryptocurrencies um, uh, attracts uh, speculation, but there are some other people who already have cryptocurrencies believing that this is a startup kind of money and because uh, it is going to be a system in the future we need to think in the long run what may happen such as investing in google in 1999 and a person such as elon musk who is a troll in social media. Uh, he may say uh, some argument today and a different argument tomorrow. So there's people manipulating the market so that they can then buy more. Or there's people who believe he's a hero because he's giving the opportunity to people to buy Bitcoins at a cheaper price and people can buy more of this global and decentralized money which probably will prevail in the future, who knows? Well, thank you very much, Leif, and thank you, uh, thank all of you. Uh, we are four minutes late, but it is such an exciting topic, at least for me. I didn't have great knowledge on this topic, and I did learn quite a lot from all of you, listening to all of you, and we could learn much more if we had two more hours ahead of us. I'm sure we will have the opportunity to ask these questions in the future because it is a very interesting topic that is starting, that has a long journey ahead of it, where regulation is going to be uh, established, where more technology is going to be created. So for the moment, you are there to illustrate us. I thank you for your participation, and I hope to see you very soon on a different event. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, Monse, Pepe, Julio, Juan Liz, and Leif. See you soon. See you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. The participants of this roundtable analyzed the impact of immediate transfers and they highlighted it is a technological revolution that is changing the life of citizens and also that Spain is the second country where most immediate transfers are used. We now propose you a break and we will soon resume the digital coin and European financial system Seville virtual summit with a round table about regulation, which is one of the key topics of this new economic and financial digital system. See you very soon.
poder ayudar a los clientes con sus planes y sus proyectos es lo que da sentido a nuestro trabajo y lo que nos mueve a levantarnos cada mañana. Queremos estar cerca de ti siempre que lo necesites, estés donde estés. Te ofrecemos soluciones a cualquier hora del día a través de nuestros canales remotos o acudiendo a nuestra red de oficinas y agentes donde te atenderá tu gestor. Porque ya sea de forma presencial o a distancia, todos los canales tienen algo en común. Personas que se esfuerzan día a día para que tengas el mejor servicio. Santander es uno de los principales bancos de la zona euro con más de 150 años de evolución y expansión internacional. Santander. Soluciones, seguridad y servicio. Los pagos ya no son exclusivos de los bancos. Día a día compramos y contratamos servicios de forma diferente. Usamos el móvil para abonar un café o pagar un trayecto. Un mundo a golpe de clic. Donde la competición es altísima. Las grandes tecnológicas, las fintechs, los nuevos bancos digitales. Todos en una disputa continua para hacerse con el control de la experiencia de pago. Y en este escenario nace Minsight Payments. Expertos en medios de pago, potenciando la innovación para generar un valor añadido en nuestros clientes. Estamos a la vanguardia. Creamos conexiones entre los players relevantes. Contamos con una oferta única de servicios en torno al dato y la analítica. En Minsight Payments... Nos anticipamos al negocio del futuro, porque formamos parte de él. Bienvenidos de nuevo. Welcome back to the Digital Coin and European Financial System Seville Virtual Summit. Today we are going to reflect upon regulation as key to the sustainability of this new financial system. We will start with two lectures and then we will have a round table. First, we will introduce Victor Rodriguez. He is the General Manager of Strategic Policy and International Affairs at the National Securities Market Commission. Welcome. Bueno, buenos días, muchas gracias. Good morning and thank you for inviting me to this event, which I think is very interesting. Many experts have been speaking since yesterday around cryptocurrencies and the technology of cryptocurrencies. And in this context, this can foster a transformation which can be a significant 
uh, I'm going so speaking about this topic and the regulation of crypto seems very appropriate in these times. I'm going to refer to crypto as those meant for paying or those issued by uh, financial institutions. I'm not going to speak in detail about them because afterwards Dolores Marquez is going to speak in detail about this topic. So I'm going to focus on the crypto actives that can be an investment product uh, that customers uh, value the buying these crypto actives. And I think most of the crypto actives uh, being uh, exposed in different different platforms. So in 2017, when at CMV, we received questions around issuing of crypto actives for uh, financing different projects, the national ECOs, for example. And this phenomenon was not all restricted to Spain. It made us to think about what would be the adjustment for these new operations in the regulation. Besides trying to coordinate criteria and coordination, especially in Europe, in DESMA, the speed, the rate, uh, we had all these questions and investments. We needed to have a new approach. And our central banks had a pattern, and I think it's logic, the normative referred to the payment instruments. In the stock markets, we tried to analyze if these crypto act, uh, assets uh, could uh, fit to the definition of uh, negotiable value. We in CMV had wide criteria, including the idea that if they would be offered as investment, it, the, the regulation of the stock market needed to be applied. So we had to analyze all these ecos, and this prevented that many of these issuings, which were not very trustworthy, would uh, be uh, marketed in the Spanish market. In parallel, in Europe, we were exchanging opinions around crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, it, but it didn't advance very quick. Uh, against Singapore or Gibraltar, where they already uh, drafted laws and uh, guidelines for the regulation of these uh, crypto assets. But we didn't follow this this rate in Europe nor in the United States. The issuing of crypto coins, cryptocurrencies, which calls the attention of companies and investors. Um, in 2018, we, in the Bank of Spain, we issued uh, many uh, reports explaining or pointing out the many risks. From the regulatory point of view, not wanting to simplify too much, we had to face basically two big questions. On the one side, we had the need to have a harmonized regulation at European level to give tools to uh, keep order in the issuing of new crypto actives, crypto assets, and the new services around the crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, and that protected the investors. The idea was not to regulate establishing new norms that would go against the nature of these cryptos, but the main objective that we follow, we try to reach, with, is to have a transparency framework with different elements, mainly try, try to prevent to use these instruments in an illicit way, to have available uh, information to inform this to the investor the uh, different risks, to establish mechanisms that prevent the manipulation of prices, and that we grant the uh, privacy and security of the customers. In general, the main norms uh, of the services related with crypto assets. And on the other hand, we were seeing uh, that the European norm did not allow, and it still doesn't allow, that those crypto assets considered um, negotiable values would find a space to be issued according to their characteristics, leveraging their potential advantages, but also giving uh, securities to the investors. In parallel, there was a new project with an uh, international dimension. Uh, and I'm speaking about the project of Facebook, the big technological company which announced their intention to in, uh, issue the Libra, the uh, crypto coin uh, based in Switzerland, which would be used as payment means. And it was not easy to flag in a way. There was an interesting debate 
around this, especially between the United States and Facebook, but this debate did not end with a, a good solution for both. But it shed some light on the regulatory debate, and it made visible the priority and the need to establish a quick uh, regulatory framework. Other initiatives were emerging in Europe. The first one refers to inclusion as obliged subjects in terms of uh, capital laundering or money laundering uh, on those platforms of fiat uh, money. All this within the fifth directive on uh, la money laundering uh, requiring different uh, or, uh, ordering methods and structures, and this directive has passed, has become a new Spanish normative, and it's already in our legal basis. The second one is a pilot regime which will allow to create market structures and try all these uh, distributed uh, systems to, to be able to offer the potential benefits without restrictions, being able to innovate with this technology. The idea is not having limitations in terms of blockchain networks that we can test, regulate this activity, and maybe we will be able to see a convergence between this type of financial instrument and the crypto ecosystem. The idea is that in five-year times, we assess all these tests and the possible benefits and to take a decision in order to adapt all this in the general norm. And the third initiative is the MICA uh, framework. It will be the framework for all those crypto assets which are not financial instruments, bank deposits, insurance instruments, etc. For example, different utility tokens or, for example, the NFTs, non-fungible tokens, uh, they will also not be within the scope of this regulation. So this regulation will regulate all crypto assets except those that I have just mentioned and will also regulate different things, especially two that supervisors are concerned with, which is the emission, the issuing of crypto assets and also the services with its instruments. And the division will be simple between those crypto assets which are not stable regarding um, different uh, assets and the rest of crypto currencies which will be included in the scope of this regulation. There will be requirement of requirements of transparency and different requirements. And also there will be a regime of updating supervision and sanction of the different services uh, for the crypto uh, coins. This will be based on the existence, existing uh, legal basis uh, within the MITI, the Directive of Market and Financial Instruments, this MICAS, Marketing Crypto Assets, will be the main regulation. So it will be inspired in the norm in this regulation to give uh, normative instruments for, for example, the platforms for exchange of crypto assets. There will be a counterpart. And they will be like a, a normal uh, company of inf investment services. And also those exchanges, which will be similar to the multilateral systems of uh, trading or negotiation in the investment field. And another example would be the providers of escrow services, which will be similar to the traditional ones, even though the activity is a bit different. At national level, and parallel to these uh, negotiations, these discussions in Europe, especially in the MICA regulation, we find other countries like uh, Germany, which have their own regulation already, maybe not so complete as the MICA one. And in Spain, we have several initiatives, like, as you know, the CMV uh, can update or have other uh, con con administrative control instruments for those crypto actives as investment uh, tools. So the main objective will be to prevent the uh, laundering and the bad use of these crypto coins for the investments, and so they have they have enough information on the risks and the nature of these crypto of these cryptos because we have seen in these last weeks in these past weeks the big volatility of the prices of the main cryptocurrencies. So the idea is to regulate, as I said before, 
without going against, not going against the nature of cryptocurrencies to leverage the advantages, but also protecting the investor. This is a great challenge related with cryptocurrencies, not all, not just with the technology, but with their cryptocurrencies, and because they evolve very quickly, and that obliges the norm to have. Uh, future perspective, but always regulation goes behind reality, as we all know, especially in this case, because it, didn't, it wasn't able to go so fast. I wanted to conclude saying that we need to be aware that regulation is necessary. We need to create it as soon as possible, but also in the same way, it's also very important to have financial education and uh, the awareness measures on the risks of certain cryptocurrencies. These are uh, necessary measures so that invest investors know the uh, risk and the nature of their methods, and we need to give them the tools to complete this training. Thank you very much. El director general de política the general manager of strategic policy and international affairs at the National Securities Markets Commission, Victor Rodriguez, said that if a crypto asset is offered as an investment, it needs to be regulated by the National Securities Market Commission. We will now listen to the second lecture related to regulation. It's a pleasure to welcome José Manuel Marquez, head of the Financial Innovation Division at the Bank of Spain. Well, I would like to thank the organizers for having me. Congratulations on uh, this uh, forum, given the depth and importance of such an event around uh, digital uh, coins and uh, this new context. My discussion today wishes to focus mainly on uh, the uh, digital uh, coin and uh, the regular context. So the digital euro and regulatory context in the last two years, the debate around digital currency and developed financial systems has moved from the academic arena very much focused on issues such as the implications for monetary policy to a more pragmatic uh, field, analyzing the technical possibilities available and scrutinizing in detail the concrete implications for payment systems and the financial ecosystem as a whole. So practically all central banks, it is indeed true, there was a survey that says that 80% of these central banks have entered the, into this type of debate, albeit for different reasons. The debate is not the same in countries where the distribution of cash and the Access to financial services is a challenge. Well, emerging countries, island countries where there is difficulties, uh, uh, the connection among their territories, as in those uh, uh, countries with a developed competitive and highly efficient financial system, and in particular a payment system in the latter, uh, which include the euro system, but also most large economies, including the United States, the UK, Japan, Canada, the approach uh, to CBDC has more to do with being prepared for a future in which the adoption of new technologies such as uh, distributed registers or digital identity make it necessary to adapt uh, the way in which citizens access central bank capital. Then with uh, issues related to financial inclusion. In addition, the lack of reaction, uh, not being prepared, uh, for possible future needs may lead uh, private intermediaries to end up developing means of payment that are more adapted to these technological innovations, thus shifting the means of payment to environments, to suppliers that are less supervised by central banks, or even increasing the influence of other currencies. On the one hand, in an increasingly digital world, it is uh, possible that the use of uh, traditional methods of payment, such as cash, may be in decline, decline, something that has been happening for some time in Scandinavian countries. and. Uh, 
This has been accentuated uh, by the pandemic, and they may end up uh, causing access problems in groups with uh, connectivity difficulties or in age groups that have more difficulties with the use of new technologies. So this is one of the reasons for which many central banks uh, are considering the use of CBDC as a, an element that complements the use of cash and be a universal payment channel in our societies so that we have um, digital uh, formulae and cash that needs to be maintained to guarantee access uh, uh, and um, offline operations. All of these aspects scenarios uh, that may lead us to the introduction of digital coins, the requirements and uh, uh, design options are extensively covered in a report published by the Eurosystem in October last year. This uh, report uh, is uh, the conclusions of a high-level working group that was uh, drafted at the beginning of the past year, and uh, the results were published. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, the uh, basic uh, summary is that uh, there are different scenarios that make it necessary to develop and launch a digital uh, euro, a task that, uh, as you can surmise, cannot be done uh, quickly, and uh, you cannot improvise. This uh, requires painstaking prior work in many areas. And in this regard, uh, this is what we are currently doing once the report was published. Uh, activity has been uh, frenetic on several fronts. On the one hand, experimentation tests have been initiated to learn firsthand about the possibilities of different uh, technological options in which a digital euro could rest. Additionally, intense uh, contact has been made with society through a survey to which more than 8,000 uh, responses have been received in the euro system. And we've had uh, bilateral uh, contacts uh, with professionals and companies of reference in technological and financial matters. Uh, the idea is to learn the main concerns uh, for society and uh, professionals to make uh, the design of uh, the digital euro better. We have uh, intense uh, discussions uh, with uh, uh, central banks of other countries, and uh, we've learned about numerous initiatives, and the idea is to coordinate uh, interoperability, for example. We've also had uh, close uh, contact uh, and continue to have close contact uh, with, uh, again, European authorities because this is critical for society as a whole and uh, because no one is unaware of the dimension of this uh, project and the important synergies in Midhive with the digital strategy being developed by the European Commission. Bearing in mind these uh, premises, I would like to devote the rest of my speech to briefly commenting on some of the main issues that uh, we must uh, resolve before considering issuing, if necessary, a digital currency. First, design. In principle, it may seem a technological issue to decide the, the level of centralization of issuance or registration in accounts or tokens or bearer instruments. These are linked to scalability, efficiency, or latency, which sounds uh, very engineering-like, very technical. But the implications of design are fundamental in uh, essential areas. Uh, such as disruptive potential, some design may allow for connection and uh, increase in methods of payment and interoperability with other methods of payment. Others can be more complicated. Some may be more flexible to adapt to technological evolution. Others uh, just the opposite. Some designs are easier for new participants and uh, in other cases, uh, this access is more complicated. So design implications are important as regards, for example, competition. This is uh, key for uh, European uh, competition uh, 
agency. So design uh, might seem a very technical aspect, but uh, it has uh, uh, many implications uh, in uh, its essence. Then I'd like to touch on uh, privacy and anonymity. This is one of the issues uh, uh, most concerned to citizens as uh, a result of the survey conducted in this aspect that there are multiple options ranging from anonymity to different degrees of privacy that restrict the use of transaction information by the authorities and supervised entities participating in the ecosystem. It goes without saying that this is one of the most controversial and difficult aspects in a digital society in whose dimension, my opinion, is beyond uh, the competence of the financial authorities. And uh, in any case, its definition, uh, the definition of privacy and uh, anonymity should be aligned with the principles established by the European authorities. Discussions are underway. The third aspect I would like to underline would be the regulatory compliance. Obviously, the digital euro must comply with the established rules. Uh, it's obvious. It's a, uh, basic, and uh, there are obvious implications that condition all other aspects of the way in which uh, we uh, address compliance uh, regarding uh, anti-money laundering, uh, customer principles or requirements for digital identity can be essential aspects that condition the level of privacy uh, or innovation or the role that other intermediaries uh, uh, may play besides the central bank. Because all of this uh, affects uh, the design uh, of the digital euro as well as uh, privacy. Something that is also uh, critical is the implications for the financial system, the introduction of the digital euro depending on its design and its characteristics may have fundamental consequences for the financing of financial institutions it may have consequences for the emergence uh, of new participants in the financial system or for the so-called uh, development of what has come to be known as decentralized finance. It is important from the regulator's standpoint and the authorities that uh, guarantee uh, financial stability that this transition, the changes to develop in an orderly manner. So without uh, uh, creating... Uh, without uh, creating problems because you have to uh, oversee and uh, assess, but we should also reflect on the system that we want to have, look at its resilience and the implications from a legal uh, security standpoint. And finally, I'd like to touch on the international dimension. Most uh, proposals that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation uh, are eminently local in, uh, in nature, uh, retail in nature. So they try to take into account all stakeholders, uh, small too. So at the same time, there is a, a work that is being done at instance of the G20, but the FSB is also involved, and also the CPMI, the Committee of Mar Mar Payment and Market Infrastructure, whereby they're trying to improve the efficiency of cross-border payments while at the same time trying to regulate private proposals for what have come to be known as global stable coins. So large entities uh, like Facebook that try to offer methods of payment that may work locally, uh, it could be work uh, for cross-border payment purposes. So the, the central banks are focused very much on local aspects. It is also important to bear in mind that the emergence of digital uh, currencies uh, in different jurisdictions sh should not give way to fragmentation of international uh, transactions. But quite the opposite. This should be a way to improve efficiency and improve uh, cross-border 
water payments, which is something we're working on, and one has to do with interconnection and interoperability of a digital uh, currencies in different jurisdictions. And to close, uh, just a, a brief reflection, you will agree with me that all of these challenges are of enormous importance, especially when you consider that at the end of the day, we're talking about one of the basic infrastructure for our economy. I like to say that methods of payments are like the uh, pipes uh, in a uh, house, uh, uh, you may not see them, but if they are blocked or don't work well, you find out very quickly. So we want uh, this house uh, to offer well-being. So it's not surprising that this uh, initiative requires a huge effort and enormous talent. And also, the deadlines to carry this out uh, are not uh, precisely short. They take time, and we need to take into account uh, all the aspects. Uh, and uh, this is complex, but uh, at the same time, it's necessary, because if we need to put this in motion, you can't do this in a fortnight. We need to work hard on this, and that's what we're all doing, as I've mentioned. It's all about being prepared to adapt to challenges that might come along with the use of new technology. Many of the latter are emerging, are not mature yet, but we're seeing that they may bring about uh, important uh, changes to our economy. So methods of payment need to be in line with these new challenges. And we need to consider uh, the characteristics of our financial systems and the perspectives and priorities for each country may vary depending on the starting point of their financial systems. The discussion is different in China and the Euro system or in the United States, for example, but we also need to take into account the expectations uh, that citizens uh, may have, the use of digital currencies, but also uh, core values that we have as a society, including uh, competition and privacy, as well as uh, all the uh, risks uh, derived of uh, CBDCs so that we do not uh, disrupt uh, anything unnecessarily. Thank you very much. I hope you found my presentation interesting. In the intervention of Jose, In Jose Manuel Marquez's lecture, he said that all the central banks have now started discussing digital currencies, and in order to carry out a risk analysis, prior work needs to be done. After these two first lectures, we will now move on to a round table about regulation as key to the sustainability of the new financial system, moderated by Maria Rotondo, counselor at the International Working Group on Digital Currencies. She will present all the participants in this round table. Good morning. Let us begin with the next panel, Regulation, Key to Sustainability of the New Financial System. We have a fantastic panel. The uh, previous discussions have been uh, fascinating, and uh, we have uh, Enrique Titos, who is an independent uh, director and director of the Digital Money and Payment uh, Systems Group at FIDE, where I participate too, and others uh, here also. Then we have uh, Jose Maria Anguiano, who's a partner at Garrigues, Pablo Zalba, who is a uh, director of regulation at Deloitte, and Lorena Muyor, who's a digital banking advisor at the Spanish Banking Association. So they all complement each other very well, and the panels that we've held for preparatory work have been uh, really, really uh, fantastic because they come from different ecosystems. So, and the, the, these are very passionate speakers. So you're really going to enjoy this panel for sure. I have decided uh, to take the title of the panel: Regulation Key to Sustainability sustainability of the new financial system and work from there. We have some key words there, like, for example, regulation, sustainability, and financial system, a new financial system. So to kick off, I would like to begin with the first 
keyword, regulation. So, I think that the first question that we can put out there is when we discuss regulation, should we take on a broader meaning of regulation, i.e. governance, because not only things are done on the basis of regulation, but uh, issues are articulated around uh, broader uh, meanings. Uh, for example, we have uh, in the corporate world Facebook announcing Libra based on board number of companies that's you no know, regulator. Or when it comes to blockchain and uh, distributed uh, currencies and applications, and from a regulation standpoint, this uh, very summit holds the word European in its title. So how do really fit national, regional, European regulations in a globalized uh, world where you can have an IP and buy and sell across the globe? where the governance of IP networks are varied. And for example, you have uh, different ways of managing this in China and elsewhere in decentralized uh, blockchain platforms. So how to fit this regulation? And finally, as regards regulation, I learned from Juan Arena. I'm always uh, always be uh, thankful to him. Government governance has to do with uh, corporations and um, uh, organizations and individuals. And uh, here we're discussing P2P, right? Peer to peer. So, how about starting with uh, Jose Maria Anguiano? Would you care to start? Well, for me, uh, blockchain has uh, a lot to do with the uh, proof. I am one to have a specific uh, consideration. I think it shouldn't be odius tantum, like with the uh, digital signatures. I think this is something that has to be validated by judges. And uh, right now, we see that the use of uh, decentralized uh, matrix uh, evidence or proof like logalty. So each transaction is sent to a number of notary publics, and you need to, the agreement of all of said notaries uh, to alter the proof matrix. And uh, this is being accepted uh, peacefully. Uh, there is no special controversy. And uh, when uh, there is controversy and is explained to judges, they understand this very well. So this is a probative. Uh, this is a, has evidential value, and judges will have the last say. But I think that we should give uh, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, give this uh, a um, say uh, normality. Of course, uh, we have uh, the issuance uh, of uh, coins, and uh, we also have ICOs and regulators are trying to stress the importance of transparency. Some ICOs over the past uh, years uh, have had this kind of problem. They have not been transparent enough, so legislators, let alone regulators, have swiftly reacted to this and said, uh, careful with this, uh, we need uh, to produce uh, information in a way uh, that uh, investors uh, be clear on uh, what they are investing on. Jose Maria, but don't you think that there should be some kind of protection? Because when you look at young people, for example, who are purchasing bitcoins, 
Well, that's just a greed right there. I don't think that we need a specific regulation for that. I think it has to do with the, the way you do things, but uh, the protected legal good is the same. We need to, to have evidence to know whether we're talking about uh, an investment or uh, negotiable uh, values or securities, or whether we're uh, talking about uh, tokens and then legislate. So I think it's more about use rather than technology. And use, in most cases, are pretty similar. I don't... Uh, favor over-regulation, especially in generalist uh, contexts. I don't think that is the solution. Okay, so Lorena, you're up next. Well, I would like to discuss uh, blockchain technology to discuss yet others that affect uh, financial systems in this new competitive environment. And Maria, as you have rightly mentioned, digitization, new technologies go beyond uh, borders. The different international fora, like the Financial Stability Board, the uh, International uh, Payment Bank have been exploring, studying, uh, putting together guides and recommendations to address the great many challenges faced by the financial systems. They've uh, published reports on uh, operational digital um, uh, use, uh, reports on cryptos, stable coins, the impact of big tech in the Basel uh, Banking Committee. They've been uh, deep diving on these uh, issues of CBCs and there's a uh, central bank coordination. So a huge international effort is being undertaken to publish guides uh, that are implemented in jurisdictions who need to regulate and they're sovereign and can decide to accept uh, and uh, implement uh, partially or in full and adapt uh, their regulations. All of this is necessary to provide order to the different challenges met by the different markets because, Maria, you've mentioned there's a lot of P2P uh, transactions among peers, but there is usually a brokerage, a platform, and infrastructure behind, and there are goods in, out there in the market, uh, like data protection, uh, consumer protection, market uh, integrity, anti-money laundering that need to be observed and protected. So those uh, brokers need to be, um, say, uh, governed by regulations to give guarantee to the market so that everybody is sure that all of these innovations work well, they are successful and don't uh, put the financial stability at risk. Well, that is precisely what I was um, t saying. There's the regulators, but we're living in a globalized world, and there's a correlation among uh, companies in the same industry than among companies in the same country often. So all of these associations and codes, guides, recommendations, practices, whatnot, have an impact. Uh, for example, the Black Rock has uh, an influence uh, out there in the market on how things are done. And um, I think it would be in interesting to hear what Pablo has to say on this topic, uh, regulation, what's uh, going on in Europe to uh, get his uh, viewpoint. Well, I would like to focus uh, uh, with the perspective of regulation and with the perspective of reaction, because uh, the fact that there is no regulation doesn't mean there is no reaction. And I'd like to take on this twofold uh, perspective uh, in keeping with what uh, Jose Maria was saying. And when it comes to digital coins, we have to look at consumer protection. And I understand uh, that we need minimum uh, demands, like uh, if you invest in uh, variable um, 
uh, markets, you, and this is, has to be true for Bitcoins, uh, a tweet by the Tesla founder announcing that uh, he has invested 1.5 billion has uh, an immediate reaction of a 15% uh, increase. And we've had just the opposite, a very uh, um, a couple days ago, so very recently. So if we are to prohibit Bitcoins, uh, then uh, we would be prohibiting uh, a product that is um, like uh, an investment in uh, variable equity. Uh, in equity funds. So we need a, a regulation, we need a mo modification, but we need to look at reaction, the reaction in this case of supervisors. So I think it would be naive to uh, uh, undervalue the impact of digital means as a method of payment uh, rather than as a, an investment instrument. There are a number of contexts, including smart economy, uh, organized crime, or countries uh, whose uh, currencies are so volatile that they have uh, high inflation rates, and thus there could be a need to have an alternative method of payment to traditional currencies, like, uh, for example, the euro or dollars. And I uh, mentioned earlier that Tesla announced one thing, they changed uh, their minds, they had a change of hearts, like you could buy a Tesla car with, with Bitcoins, but in the US there are 2,000 establishments where you can pay with the digital currencies. This is a very interesting uh, report. Uh, uh, published by Deloitte, it's 0.007% uh, of all st establishments, but uh, this has been uh, true for other companies. So I think it is important to look at what supervisors do, what regulators do, but we need to look at the reaction of digital coins. And there are reactions. Uh, the People's Bank of China has um, already been tested with digital yuan. The European Central Bank is uh, analyzing the implementation of a digital euro. And uh, the Federal Reserve is working along the same lines, though lagging behind slightly. So there is a reaction. The European Central Bank's reaction may have an impact on uh, the financial uh, system uh, uh, Ability. So there are many uh, variables and there is a reaction. And I think this is uh, quite uh, appropriate uh, because uh, ignoring this reality would uh, be mean risking the adequate uh, monetary policy management in the future, given its importance uh, for economies. Because if we, there is a trend towards other methods of payment, uh, methods of payments other than uh, euros in Europe or dollars in the States, there would be uh, a risk uh, to the uh, monetary uh, policy management. So I celebrate this discussion opened by the European Central Bank, which will probably lead to the digital euro. We have to be prudent, cautious, so as not to risk uh, stability because something has to be done. Uh, Pablo, yes, uh, you touched upon the digital euro subject. So we, we are also talking about coins or currencies. A currency, I'm an economist, um, I graduated in university. A currency or a coin was defined as a unit that allowed for fragmentation. Digital currencies actually allow you to do uh, fragmentation in a limitless manner. Besides, on a blockchain platform, you have execution rate, and then you have the exchange means and the account unit and the value unit. In this case, bitcoins are assigned a value by the person or the entity buying or selling. What is different with the digital euro if compared to the current euro? Uh, 
We don't know. We don't fully know what the difference is because the project is underway. But a unit is understood as follows. If I have a digital euro, it is in the European Central Bank and therefore it is fully warranted. The same as a euro coin or the same as a tenner, as a 10 euro note. The incentive here is for me to have unlimited euros, and I will have them, obviously, with the Central European Bank because of the security of having it there. Therefore, the Central European Bank has opened a discussion about how to prevent the digital euro from causing instability in the financial market. So the discussion is about the amounts of your deposits in the Central European Bank and the interest you're going to have to be pay, uh, charged. I'm um, just giving you an example. The interest rate could be uh, zero if you have uh, quite a lot of money. Um, depending on the volume. So that could actually operate as a non-incentive. But in a banking system context, would you be willing to pay for interest in that case? I wouldn't think so. Or you could limit volumes to 2,000 euros. You could have 2,000 euro in the European Central Bank. That wouldn't prevent the existence of a secondary digital euro market. And so uh, your relatives or you could not have a higher amount of euro, which would affect the value of the currency, of the euro currency. So it is a huge challenge. I'm absolutely sure the European Central Bank will uh, resolve it. But in my opinion, doing nothing is much greater a risk than implementing a digital euro in spite of the two examples that I described. Yes, um, I agree with you. It's um, monetary policy if you, uh, you could have direct injection into the European Central Bank. Enrique Titos has not yet intervened. Enrique Titos is director of the working group in FIDE, where I participate too. Enrique, could you share your opinion about how Europe is positioned in terms of financial innovation or Europe in the field of cryptocurrencies? Because obviously regulation has an impact on innovation. Is a bit of a trade-off. Do I regulate? Do I not regulate? Too much? Too little? So. What's your opinion about innovation? You have the floor, Enrique. Thank you. Oh, it's a very broad question indeed, um, but I suppose the answer has to be general too. I'm not saying anything new if I say Europe is regulating quite a lot if compared to other global blocks. Uh, China comes to mind, the US comes to mind, different models, absolutely. In China, regulation follows um, innovation and regulation is very much based on exploring. Hence, uh, China has given way to huge technologically uh, developed sectors because their regulation was very lenient versus places such as Europe. In the United States, uh, they are very, very entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial, sorry, and all the subjects relating to crypto coins in actual fact have emerged from Silicon Valley. Bitcoin, we don't actually know the person behind it, behind the concept, but all other 
crypto coins have been born there in the United States. The, for bitcoins, well, we could mention Coinbase and Binance, uh, also based in the United States. The former is a system based by a Chinese person, but with uh, different headquarters uh, throughout the world. So, how is Europe positioned? Europe is aligned with the financial distribution model that Europe has, which is very different from the Anglo-Saxon context in that uh, area. Finance dwell a system which is basically presided over by banks, and that's a matter of fact. Here, the integrated capital market still a project uh, about to, to fully developed, and all crypto deposit markets are replications of a technology which is the blockchain technology. Precisely because of that, the Anglo-Saxon setting, the British um, uh, system, the US is so powerful technology-wise because they have that, that capital base with them. To some extent, European citizens, and if I may, I would like to generalize in this case, but they have been really uh, saving people while Americans are investor investors. So the difference is quite marked as regards the knowledge of financial Markets uh, taking risks in financial markets, no, no, sorry, having the knowledge about uh, risks and profitability, which places Europe in a disadvantaged position. That is a matter of fact, I would say, and uh, we need to to navigate those waves, and that's in line with my colleague's comment. Protecting investors is important. Explaining things to investors is important. Technology is not to be banned, but investors are to be properly informed about what they are buying, and let them buy, let them make mistakes. Making mistakes is ever so healthy a practice. Of course, making mistakes on the basis of a lack of information is not right. That is dysfunctional. And that we cannot do. Other than that, Europe and Spain should have a more permissive attitude uh, regulation-wise, obviously uh, trying to overcome asymmetries and dysfunctions. In other words, how to tackle issues concerning integrity laws in markets, prevention of system risks, that's yet another interesting aspect. Bitcoin is close to system risks with a huge you know, value of 1.2 billions or trillions. You know. I would like to draw attention to difficulties faced by regulators in changing scenarios, radically changing scenarios. Therefore, going back to your first question, I find it convenient to have governance schemes or programs. Governance, once you agree with the best practice, you have governance before regulation comes for, uh, in such a way that governance ultimately can be regulated in the interim. Governance, governance becomes a good practice, a best practice. Yes, uh, Lorena, over to you now. Uh, Lorena, as you know, is in the Spanish Society of Bankers. Uh, what is the competitive environment like, uh, Lorena, in your view? Because uh, all of a sudden, uh, we have uh, Libra, uh, Libra, sorry, uh, Facebook, 2,500 million users, a panel, you know, together with Vodafone and other companies uh, putting together a number of coins in a basket uh, based on the decision of the board. And then Remimbi, for instance. What do you think about the new context, the new environment? 
I am a member of a number of boards of financial institutions, and I can assure you that the Compliance Committee and the Auditing Committee find regulation most important. So, uh, Pablo also mentioned it in the preparatory sessions. If I am in an unstable country, for instance, Argentina, Venezuela, then even that even though that in currency might be unstable, I could be interested. And then disclosure. Based on my experience in this sector, if you go back 30 years in time with mobile phones, you know, we remember the prepaid contracts without an address, without a name. Uh, well, uh, early adopters in mobile phones had a lot to do with informal economy. So, Lorena, what do you think about the competitive environment? I suppose there are quite a few challenges there, too. Uh, yes, you are right. Um, new digital technologies have given way to reducing uh, barriers to accessing the sector. Costs have been reduced. Information asymmetries have been reduced, too. There are non-existent at present, and, of course, they allow for scale economies. And hence, new players have appeared in the market first, the fintech companies, then the big tech companies. They are now entering uh, some financial sectors and activities. Fintech, which uh, uh, carry out more varied activities, I would say are more focused on activities with a lighter uh, regulatory framework, uh, greater profitability with payments, for instance. And even though they are focused on such activities only or mostly, what we cannot do is underestimating the impact of the overall financial services they provide. And that is being uh, carefully being looked up. And then these ecosystems migrate into more fragmented sectors with more service providers and with critical technology providers to ensure services via digital channels which are not fully covered by supervisors. Bear in mind that this further complicates surveillance and supervision of risks and um, by auditors and supervisors to be able to provide digital services. Organizations tend to use data, technology, and infrastructure supplied by the big digital platforms, which in turn are entering the financial market. Therefore, there is a risk they may develop certain behaviors which may have an impact on conditions, for instance, denying access to their competitors, access to this infrastructure, or to give preference or priority to their own services. The second impact is related to the fact that the new technologies allow new businesses to emerge, businesses that supply services which are similar to usual financial activities, but which are not fully acknowledged or recognized by the regulatory framework in place and therefore lack the safeguards users are entitled to. A very clear example we find in this world. And the third impact is related to the undesired effects of the impacts on the real economy, on the financial capacity brought out by some innovative models along with companies without the necessary scale which go unsupervised. This is the case of Libra, Facebook, and the first version. Uh, of course, um, the a parallel monetary system uh, was created, which could have repercussions on monetary sovereignty, particularly for countries with these uh, currencies. Therefore, in the end, in recent years, we've seen many international authorities discussing 
about how to adapt the regulatory framework to new risks emerging in this new competitive environment. Bear in mind the boundaries of this uh, regulation in finance market has been very little adjusted. There are some exceptions, though, in the adoption of international and national frameworks for crowdfunding, for instance. And, of course, there is a proposal from the European Union, which means a step ahead in adopting regulation to new challenges, but no major adjustments have taken place, and I suppose that's why most jurisdictions have started an exploration phase to try and see how regulation can be remodeled in such a way that competition and competitiveness is ensured on the basis of equality and that consumer protection is preserved. Maria, if I may jump in, please be my guest. Well, I would like to make a reflection in line with what Lorena was saying, because I think there's a reasonable level playing field these days from the perspective of fintech and financial entities. Uh, there is a huge difference uh, between a fintech and a financial entity one admits deposits, the other does not. So sorry if I'm a bit disruptive here, but if a financial entity wants to have the same uh, regulation as a fintech, it's easy. Stop accepting deposits, cease to accept uh, deposits, and uh, you can have a, a less stringent regulation. Uh, this could have an impact, as Lorena was saying, on companies, but from the point of view of regulation, there is a reasonable level playing field. And uh, as with everything in life, there's always room for improvement. A second reflection has to do with the entry of fintech. I do believe that the European financial uh, industry needs to reflect on this. When I was uh, in the European Parliament, uh, I worked at the PS2. I, um, I think that uh, one of the things that was um, more interesting was to improve the use of credit cards, uh, strengthening the single market, and um, we wanted to boost uh, the innovation of the payment uh, industry. So we had Mark and uh, FinTechs uh, with this could take uh, data from financial entities. And um, the financial entities did not wage that war. They uh, fought the war of uh, the exchange rates. Uh, but they, if fintechs could have access uh, to data, why can't uh, financial entities have the same uh, access to that uh, data? So I think they did not. Uh, they did not uh, started uh, working on that. Um, and to be ready for uh, the impact of uh, PS2. So we should not uh, uh, do the same thing with the Digital Service Act. Uh, we have to move from open banking to open data. We all agree that the data is a new production factor. Financial entities uh, have data, so we should reflect on this and try to anticipate to what ha is to come to avoid uh, to repeat what happened with open banking. But the, the open data, uh, the same goes uh, with digital euro. So the financial entities are in a good position to anticipate to what is going to happen and be at the spearhead of uh, this and look at uh, the benefits uh, of the implementation of a digital euro. Lorena, uh, given this uh, asymmetrical regulation, uh, banks have to provide certain data and fintechs don't. Uh, your view on this, your take on this? Well, in response to Pablo, I think uh, there is no leveled uh, playing field, but uh, it's not only uh, how credit entities are regulated, uh, but there are and some actors uh, who, in the market uh, that require regulations, but uh, we were talking about deposits, uh, and uh, yes, we need to have prudential regulation, and our regulation is uh, there. 
However, the latter is applied not only to the main bank, but also to all of the subsidiaries, be it uh, financial entities that are undertaken risk and others non-financial entities uh, that do take their deposits that don't pose a risk to the bank's uh, operation. This adds an additional regulation layer to subsidiaries that uh, make them be in a disadvantage uh, because they are uh, because of what I've mentioned. So at a time where we are competing and need to undertake an investments and uh, innovate, this uh, is uh, no incentive to invest in innovative uh, companies. So I think that the prudential framework should be reviewed so that there is a greater proportionality for these uh, requirements uh, for uh, entities under a uh, holding or group. And then Pablo, we have uh, AML, transparency, customer or protection uh, regulations that are more uh, stringent uh, than those applied to others. And as regards uh, PS2, I uh, don't know whether we didn't uh, wage that war or, or really um, uh, being, we weren't uh, enough involved, but when you look at uh, the benefits of having a data uh, economy that is open and with all this new innovation uh, that is coming about with the use of data, indeed banks uh, at this point of time uh, should uh, favor an intersectorial framework of data exchange that goes beyond uh, open banking or open finance, which is what the European Commission is striving for. We need uh, uh, users to be able to share uh, their information, their data with third parties. This is a right uh, that uh, users have, and it is uh, a way for there to be a greater innovation and more competitive uh, Marcus, in this case, sense, DNA is very important. And if we have time, maybe we could look at the different uh, initiatives uh, by the European Union. But uh, it is important to provide users uh, with a portability mechanism, real-time data. This is mandatory for uh, platforms because at the end of the day, uh, data, not only financial data, but other data, our digital footprint, uh, so to speak, in uh, platforms are extremely valuable for financial services. So all of these uh, uh, initiatives to open uh, data are very valued by the industry and have our support. Maria, if I may, uh, I would like to add uh, something. Uh, in what Pablo says is very interesting. He says that banks is very, very this starts sees uh, with deposits, but how many banks have uh, requested uh, that they cease to be banks? Let me see if I recall. N not a single bank? So it's not uh, that easy. Uh, if uh, competition, if, if being able to compete meant uh, ceasing to be a bank, uh, then they would have done that, right? So you need to look at uh, payment uh, traceability. If you stop uh, being a bank and uh, don't have deposits, you don't have uh, uh, a lot of information. So you are, um, uh, say, uh, trying to play with the e-commerce uh, players, uh, trying to look at you know, what customers are doing, but without that anchor. Uh, uh, i.e. deposit. So it's not as easy as uh, it might seem. And uh, I think that this two uh, regulation was uh, a regulatory surprise, which had a huge transformational reach and uh, that we'll see uh, its impact so with time with uh, the emergence of new players. At the beginning, uh, it was only fintechs, and it doesn't really, uh, it's not a big problem. But the, if uh, 
the risk of payment uh, lies with uh, BitTex, then there is a competitive regulation asymmetry, which was what Lorena was mentioning, and I think what she's saying is quite uh, valid. So we need to face this. I don't know whether there has to be a regulatory equality or other measures uh, would be uh, appropriate, but we are moving towards a new system, and uh, the digital euro will be a catalyst uh, for change. Well, that is very interesting. Maria, may I? Yes, please. Yes, uh, as re regards what Enrique was saying, there is no financial entity that has ceased to be a financial entity, but there's a proposal by Miguel Angel Fernández Ordóñez that the uh, um, President of the Bank of Spain said maybe banks could have, cease to have deposits, and deposits uh, could be at the European Central Bank. I do not agree with this proposal. I do not favor this because Europe, as opposed to the case in the States, so Jose Maria and Enrique mentioned this, uh, here there's a huge uh, dependence on uh, banking uh, finance. Uh, and uh, through the equity market, uh, two thirds in Europe, uh, one third in the States. Uh, so it is indeed true that uh, the uh, province, I was trying to be provocative, but uh, it's in, in, it makes sense for banks to have deposits. But there have been proposals, and from important uh, people uh, for. Uh, banks uh, and to uh, move their deposits to the central banks, as uh, is the case of the governor of the uh, uh, Bank of Spain. Well, that, that we're, you're talking about regulations, uh, but uh, I there are industries that uh, create their own governance. In the title of our panel, you could read the keyword sustainability. And for something to be sustainable, maybe all the responsibility should not lie with the regulator. Maybe we should play a role, as uh, has been the case in other industries. Uh, for example, in the tea industry, Unilever changed the tea market or chart with cocoa. And uh, in many industries, there are certain commodities uh, that now are articulated uh, with uh, good uh, governance um, regulations and uh, respect uh, human rights, for example, for sure. This is uh, done by them. And said, uh, to what extent uh, do we need the autonomy of uh, the parties in a financial market? And when it comes to blockchain, uh, blockchain if uh, you all of a sudden don't uh, have a network, uh, are you going to have a lender of last result or a central bank that will help you? Who's going to come and save you? Do you have to take this to court? We're talking about uh, coins, currencies, uh, where the value is provided by the parties uh, in uh, crypto assets and with smart contracts. It's a new world. And there are things that could become huge, massive. Look at Facebook, but there are other examples. Because maybe in a region, everybody can decide to create a, a digital currency for that region in Latin America or in the American continent. So I would like to put this idea out there. I think that that is very interesting, uh, Jose Maria, which you mentioned earlier. Could you uh, go deeper? Yes. Uh, let me give you a bit of a context. How strong is the will of the parties? Um, some moment in time, we thought about programmable crypto assets, and we then entered the world of smart contracts. A lot is said about smart contracts and whether or not they should be regulated. I'm not sure I would like that. I think the will of the parties, if transparency prevails and if consent is informed, can go really far. When I'm asked about 
about things being subject to smartization, I always say, is there a good sound agreement between the parties about critical matters? In other words, have financial consumers being given clear information about the nature and consequences of that business? And is there a clear consent? That's really important because if I show you a number of covenants and clauses in a contract that bind me, and if I am bound by these uh, covenants, then there is a theory, there is a principle by a professor from Harvard and Stanford, Lawrence Lessin. Uh, he's got a theory about code is law. Is code law? We're not talking about crypto worlds and legal issues, legal matters concerning the crypto world. Is code law? To what an extent is code law when we're, u- when we're using a social medium? Do we have to do the bidding of its promoter based on the implemented code? Is code law? How far does that principle go? Is it so if it does not contradict the regulations in force? Can I query the regulation of a smart contract if there is a triggering order which gives way to mechanical actions, for instance, in a contract for the funding of a motor vehicle, when installments are not paid in the loan, uh, based on the contract, uh, first uh, a warning will be displayed on the GPS screen on the car. And once the vehicle stops, that vehicle will not start up again. A geolocation trigger will be launched uh, and seen by the financial company with an allocated code. Is that possible? To me, and if we go a uh, step ahead, if we go beyond uh, proof of concept, self-execution of contract contracts can only be based on the autonomous wheels of the parties if they comply with regulations. It is a bit of a loop, a vicious circle, I think that is the case if there is informed consent with the parties. And um, I don't like interrupting people, but I think you said it all. Uh, One of the main issues here is identification. A digital entity or digital identity, the financial market, based on regulatory reasons, namely the nature of law in preventing money laundering in the financial market makes anonymous transactions very difficult and therefore we are inevitably forced to go to permissionable chains. And so the magic or part of the magic of public chains is gone. The magic's gone. As a matter of fact, when we talk about digital things, we are talking about adopting a technology which, in short, will have an impact on the very essence of the financial business. If I may, I would like to add something to Jose Maria's comment. I think it's really interesting to associate his contribution to the reform of the digital market Act. The Digital Market Act tries to stake the boundaries of technological platforms that emerge as a private law entity uh, system. Basically, they, they have their own conflict or dispute resolution devices and they implement it, in, which means they have found bits of law which somehow meet the known law 
Having said so, there are ecosystems which repute, uh, resolve their disputes amicably based on their internal rules, which is very important because that is actually the key to customer satisfaction. With smart contracts, we yet have another turning point in this internal dispute resolution system because it automates uh, routines by bringing together actions in smart contracts. And that, that's the very essence of smart contracts. But it is tremendously complicated for clients to be informed about absolutely everything in such a convenient manner uh, as, as we tend to think with smart contracts. It's hard to see how autonomous wheel with the contract parties is preserved once you enter a world in which you have to accept a seven-page condition text. Yes, and uh, we are applying this to Europe, uh, but one of the impacts of this is the inclusion of the financial market in Latin America. I understand only 30, 40 people, percent of people have a bank account, an actual bank account. And therefore, yes, uh, the autonomous wheel of the parties, who, who is in charge of educating those parties? Who is responsible? Who is accountable? Yes, you are right. We did not analyze that avenue in countries who are yet not that developed in this sector um, concerning financial inclusion, for instance, in some countries, not that remote, um, is indeed a problem in Latin America. This is a problem. And let alone the arrival of social grants given by states, by different payment methods, this can play a key role. The social dimension of fintechs and digitalization is a huge, a hugely important discussion. We don't have the time here, but it cannot be taken for granted. Of course, we are sort of focusing on the key words to try and limit the discussion, but we have a question here. Do you think the necessary regulation will start by country or will we have a European regulation? Who wants to have a go? Uh, let me say one thing, Mariana. Uh, this has to be global because these are distributed phenomena. Therefore, if regulation is not homogeneous, is not even... Uh, let me give you an example. If you launched an ICO from a country with a sort of lenient regulation, it's very easy. One of the main regulatory problems is homogenizing things, standardizing things. Germans said it very bluntly, put it very bluntly. We have to go for regulations in which supervisors are in agreement and we have to go for international regulation. Okay, we have four minutes left only, um, sort of playing by ear, but uh, it, it, it's fine, uh, you know, to talk about sustainability, as someone said. Sustainability with uh, international standards, aspects, standards that came from non-official organization. Uh, some of them even come from NGOs. Okay, you all have one minute to get a message through, a message you would like to share with the summit. Or, alternatively, how do you imagine, how do you envision the financial system in five years' time? Okay, I'll have a go. In 10 years' time, five years' time, uh, financial services will be almost fully digital. We'll take them with us on our mobile phone, on whatever device we may have, uh, watch. And I hope the environment will be a competitive one with a wide range of suppliers and providers instead of having company concentration. 
to that end, um, obviously, the, the banking sector needs to defend uh, the new technologies, apply digitalization, and I hope the administration will help us to do that. But I can see a lot of partnership being uh, forged because it is key to scalability. Scalability will be essential to the future services, digital services. Um, it will also add to cost uh, reduction. It will multiply economies of scale to be able to compete with large uh, digital service providers and large platforms. Thank you, Lorena. Pablo, um, do we still have time? Yes, 10 minutes to go. Uh, well, it will depend on regulation. It will depend on the capacity to adapt in stakeholders, in players, and the different actions they should take. For instance, if Amazon tomorrow allows Bitcoin as a payment method, that will be hugely disruptive to all other currencies. And I hope the financial sector will be able to anticipate things to be able to maximize the situation, for instance, with initiatives such as the digital euro or the digital market project that we mentioned where there is a new production framework which somehow helps financial entities to anticipate opportunities which without a doubt will be brought out. Enrique. I uh, would like uh, the conversation in this first summit to be continued in the future because that would be a sign of healthy partnership, of healthy collaboration absolutely sought after and necessary in countries like Spain, which has been too uh, unarticulated in discussions like this one. And since technologies today are cross-cutting, cross-cutting dialogues and conversations are needed. I trust Spain will be in a more advanced uh, position in five years' time if compared to today's situation. And I would like Spain to be uh, an influential country in Europe in at the front on the cutting edge instead of dragging behind other countries that are nowadays more advanced, such as Germany or France or the UK, which is no longer in the European Union. So I do hope this conversation will be continued and um, explored, further explored. Very interesting, Enrique. Thank you, Maria. I think the future of crypto coins and cryptocurrencies depends on the uh, on the consolidation of stable coins. I think there is a beta version of crypto coins, not Bitcoin, which is a purely speculative instrument. I think we will continue talking about this. Uh, if there are stable coins out there which would allow us to pay for things in a very um, convenient, fast way without having to fight investment or speculation matters. That's the key to it, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for your uh, preparation, for preparing your uh, presentations, for your very interesting ideas. I agree with Enrique. Initiatives like the summit today are absolutely important because there are many players, many parties involved, and it's uh, absolutely critical for them to have a dialogue. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. There have been several reflections in this round table. One of them is until we have a regulation, which by the way needs to be global, governance could be a good practice. Also, the speakers said that Spain has the opportunity to have a more influential role in this new financial digital system. We now start a new block related to security as key for the development of digital currencies. We will start with a lecture by Mariona Vicente. She is Innovation and Digital Transformation Manager at Caixa Bank. Good morning. 
I am Mariana Vicens, Director of Innovation Digital Transformation at Caixa Bank. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, summit. I'd like to thank uh, all the participants uh, listening in. I hope you're really making the most uh, of the wonderful panel sessions and um, presentations. I would like to share with you our view at Caixa Bank of the digital currency realm and the crypto assets. And I will uh, underscore in my presentation on the limitations or constraints that we are coming across uh, to adopt uh, these solutions by each and every one of us. and. Uh, how we believe that in uh, the coming years uh, these uh, hindrances will be overcome. On uh, the uh, slide, you will be able to see that uh, we're living a time where there's been a boom of crypto assets. The main novelty and best known for one and all is the increase in uh, value, the appreciation of uh, Bitcoin. But it is also important to highlight that we now have uh, over uh, 2,400 uh, cryptocurrencies. So there's a lot of activity. And uh, this has um, attracted the attention of organizations, including uh, banks, central banks uh, across different uh, jurisdictions. From a financial entity point of view, we're quite active in uh, learning uh, so as to be prepared for this uh, scenario uh, whereby central banks uh, will uh, indicate uh, the uh, protocol to follow and uh, how to manage a digital euro and other currencies too. As for use cases right now, there are two main trends. First would be cryptocurrencies as investment uh, instruments. Uh, this is uh, well known and is all over the papers every day. And there are initiatives to use uh, the cryptocurrencies as uh, methods of payments. We know that we will have to think about how to offer tokenization of other assets, there is value for sure there. It may take a little bit longer to be ready for that. And there is a greater regulatory uncertainty. But uh, I believe that uh, all uh, financial entities believe uh, uh, all of this to be important. And we need to be uh, ready to offer the services and uh, meet the expectations of the different stakeholders, not only clients. On the next slide, you will see a benchmark or starting point of sorts. We have different uh, possibilities as uh, citizens, as users, to uh, get these services. And uh, this has led to the following, which is something that will be discussed in uh, numerous uh, sessions for sure. There are risks, there are security matters that need to be addressed uh, to make sure uh, that adopting this solution uh, grows in a safe way. Right now, assuming that this uh, technology and these solutions are here to stay and are useful, especially with a view to creating new payment rails in the future, we see some constraints. We have, uh, on the one hand, the scalability because of the design per se. So blockchain as a method of payment for retailers is something that we can't uh, go about doing right now. There are protocols being developed, uh, new solutions that uh, will allow us to overcome um, these uh, challenges. 
But uh, Bitcoin, as we know it, we don't think we will be able to extensively use it as a method of payment for retail. Then when it comes to security, there is a difficulty uh, that has to do with the mining in certain jurisdictions because of the uncertainty. So we will have to manage uh, risks uh, accordingly, especially if we offer Bitcoin services to our customers and clients. In the case of stable coins or those issued by central banks, CBDCs, uh, this uh, constraint uh, will be overcome in short. Also, given we're all aware of the importance of sustainability, we need to consider the consumption of energy to maintain the network. This is a constraint to a massive use insofar as the present model is not sustainable. There are more centralized developments or powered by international organisms would allow for a better adoption. When it comes to offering uh, bitcoins massively, we need to take into account the role played by the uh, exchangers uh, because they are a link in the chain together with uh, the wallets uh, that uh, users need to have the, in order to be able to uh, buy and uh, perform uh, transfers on the next slide, you will be able to zoom in to the solutions that we believe are more interesting at the moment in uh, overcoming the constraints I have pointed out. And we're following closely to make sure that uh, as a financial institution, we're ready when it comes to offering these services. So. Bitcoins uh, right now present some limitations, uh, as I mentioned, as a use uh, uh, some method of payment for retailers. It could be considered as an investment. There are some difficulties uh, there too, and not only having to do with uh, security, but there are different initiatives uh, underway. One would be uh, Libra, launched by Facebook, uh, which is a, a private uh, cryptocurrency to favor payments uh, in the um, Facebook environment. This, initiatives, uh, this initiative allows to overcome uh, security uh, hindrances, uh, but uh, it is uh, a way to uh, overcome uh, regulatory uncertainty. And this uh, makes uh, using this uh, on a daily basis easier. Then we have other initiatives that have been uh, powered by central banks. Uh, given our presence, we know what the European Central Bank is doing. Also, the uh, Fed uh, this week or last week, they mentioned that they are going to be ready to uh, publish their draft plan in the summer of 2021. Then we have the China Central Bank. They uh, have undertaken in a very uh, ambitious uh, in initiative. Uh, and uh, with this initiative, they will overcome uh, numerous uh, difficulties and uncertainties. So uh, at uh, Caixa Bank, uh, we are preparing ourselves and developing internal uh, capabilities with the uh, legal and uh, business departments to uh, carry all of this out in a reliable way over the uh, coming months and in the coming years to different uh, customer segments and with a view to being prepared to have a close uh, look to what the European Central Bank and other organizations uh, decide. I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of the sessions in the summit, and I will see you again in the closing ceremony. Thank you for your kind attention, and thanks again to the organizers for having me.
Señalaba en su intervención la directora The Innovation and Digital Transformation Manager at Caixa Bank said that in her bank they are monitoring the development of the digital euro so they can implement it once the central bank gives the go ahead so they can provide this service to their customers. Let us listen to Angel Luis Quesada who is the CEO of Onis about digital currencies. Hola, buenas a todos. Soy Hello, my name is Angel Luis Quesada. I'm the CEO of Onit, the first company for the custody of digital assets based in Spain. And luckily, recently the first company of custody which has entered a sandbox around the world. Today, I am going to tell you a bit about custody as a point of entry to digital assets, linking with the topic of security as key for the development of digital coins. In this sense, I believe you've had the opportunity to listen previous interventions and panels, probably more specialized, about the new reality we are facing. We see that in the last few months, because even though it's been there for uh, longer, uh, last year meant a huge revolution, and markets of crypto assets are generating high profitability, high performance, which means they are attractive for small and large investors such as Vanguard, JP Morgan, BlackRock Fund, they have invested more than $14 billion in crypto assets only in 2020. We also find surprising things, such as the fact that the uh, decentralized finance grew more than 2,000% in 2020. And I like this presentation because it forces me to update it every time I did a presentation. In 2020, they moved more than 40, uh, 14 billion, and currently they have more than 100 billion. They are probably a bit below right now because of the fall these last days. But it's not only that. The assets under management related with the crypto world have grown 538% by institutional investors. That means there is a real interest by institutional investors to access this world. And this all comes together with a regulation in the EU that is really taking a huge leap. We would love for it to be quicker, but they are doing things relatively well, and we can find the um, AML5, the MIFID2, which is going to in include the tokenized assets, the MICA, which is co uh, covering all the crypto assets, or DORA, which will be in charge of the uh, security and cyber resilience part. Now, this will enable us for every company to access the crypto asset world. But when we wish to work with uh, digital assets, we see that there are three main problems to be solved. We have banks or neo banks or simply any company that wishes to access digital assets and offer it to their customers, we find three main hurdles. The first is the new technology. Behind every digital asset or every token, there isn't only a smart contract, but there's blockchain and there's a philosophy behind. This entails new technology teams that are specialized. On the other hand, we also have a regulatory framework that is specific in the crypto world. We have the directive on money laundering, but we have Mika, we have Dora, we have many other uh, regulations, and these generates a special regulatory effort for digital assets. And then exposure to risk. Only in 2020, more than 1.4 billion uh, crypto assets were hacked and stolen. So all the projects are, uh, are subject to an attack. 
and this is very much associated to the security part, the technology part. When we work with these technologies, let us remember that they are very modern, and we found that people who were working with these technologies were just learning how to use them. They were learning how to work with blockchain and to work with uh, exchangers connected to blockchain and so on. During the first years, this generated uh, high risks uh, from the technology side of things, taking into account that amongst the top 10 exchangers, five of them have already suffered cyber attacks. And in most of them, they could solve the problems, the, the loss of funds uh, by themselves. But it, this is not always the case. Unfortunately, we have one case that happened in Together, the crypto neobank in Spain. It is a project that is 100% recommended. And it's a pity they suffered this attack. But just some months ago, they received a cyber attack where they lost huge amounts of their funds which they couldn't recover and give back to their users. We also have to say that it is one of the most important projects in the crypto sector, and it's normal that they suffer these kind of attacks and they try to solve them as soon as possible. But we also have to say that even if traditional companies that are 100% connected online suffer attacks, uh, there were there are examples of companies that lost, uh, had a cyber attack, and they all the data of their users were exposed, and the cyber attacker didn't have the cyber hacker didn't have any kind of benefit to do so. So, uh, let's imagine if the case is where you can. Uh, still $1.4 billion. So it's important to bear this in mind because we're playing with uh, value, with a digital value. And sometimes the lack of knowledge about these new technologies uh, leads us to make mistakes. Thanks to these regulations, mainly Mika and Dora, we will start to see the regulation forcing these kind of institutions to comply with certain security standards that may mitigate or reduce potential attacks. This is why uh, the technology is so much connected. Having said that, the key piece to avoid all these kind of attacks, and one of the pieces that was most important in the last few uh, months is the custody of digital assets. If you wish to access digital assets, you need a place to keep the private keys. And this is the most critical part. Just a small remark. In the case of Together, the attack never came because of the private keys, but uh, the funds were perfectly under custody and these were not attacked. But coming back here, we have three types to manage these kind of uh, custodies. The first uh, and the most problematic ones are the hot wallets. These are wallets that are generated dynamically. They are associated to the funds of each of our users. And they are not safe. We made the mistake when we started to work with digital assets to keep them in databases, to leave them accessible, or even to uh, have them in the code. This means that any hacker that can access our system will be able to access that information, and it can be stolen. So to avoid this, the famous worm wallets were created. The worm wallets apply the same philosophy as the hot wallets. They generate dynamic systems where the users can have their wallets, but with safer security systems. The, there is encryption or multi-pack computer where they separate the key into several pieces and only going through a process that has one way, it's a one-way process, you will be able to get the private key. And maybe not getting the private key, but signing the operations. With this, if the funds or if one of the machines were hacked and uh, the access would be compromised, the warm wallets will never be uh, compromised. The final model of custody, which is the most traditional one and the safest one, is the cold vault. What does that mean? The way 
to avoid that a hacker accesses our system is just not connecting the system online, not connecting it to the internet. This is what cold vaults do. They store the keys with a hardware security module. They are machines that are encrypted at the hardware so that nobody can access the information if they take them, and they are disconnected from the network, from internet, and they can only be connected online through several gateways that make that once the data is signed, it is sent online, but it, it's only signed within the cold vault, which doesn't have access to the internet. So the hacker will never be able to access it. So these are the three types of custody that we will always um, bear in mind. These uh, custody companies, when you have a custody solution, you always have four main challenges you need to cover. First is the professionalism of the custody solution that we use. I recommend to always find custody systems or platforms that are really professional, that provide us with the maximum guarantees. This is a critical item that will solve any potential future problem. The second big challenge that we as uh, custody companies may have is complying with the regulation. It is not only about meeting the minimum requirements, we need to offer a complete regulatory coverage. Why? Because if this custody company doesn't offer a complete regulatory coverage that covers our users, we will be automatically exposed and we be we will be subject and we will need to be in charge of the regulation which doesn't interest uh, it doesn't interest at, us at all then we want systems that are agile flexible and scalable we cannot depend on the human factor every time we depend on a human factor in order to withdraw funds from a custody system the time and effort go up are increased so these systems will never be used on an agile way we need to go for hybrid systems where you may have human factors at certain points, but machine working uh, most of the times. And then the uh, cold bolt systems can go between two and three hours to give us the result of a withdrawal operation until two or three weeks. So it shouldn't be either such a short time or such a long time. We need to have a custody system that gives us guarantees but flexibility at the same time. And it should also be integrated with the crypto world. The custody, the private keys, is the point of entry to the crypto world. It is not only to store the keys, but if we find a system that is storing the keys but doesn't allow us to do anything with the keys, the problem is that we will need to have a second wallet where we need to move the funds every time we want to withdraw. So this is a problem because the custody will end up making, it will not have sense anymore. It won't make sense anymore. So this Custody systems should be able to integrate with the intro, with the crypto world, but this entails risks as well. The more we are exposed to the crypto world, we are more exposed to potential problems or errors. So the four points, if we manage to solve the four of them, we will be able to access the crypto environment in a safe way. If we fail in any of them, we will be exposing our system to a slower process, regulatory problems, or cyber attacks. We need to understand that a cyber attack, when uh, it gets our private keys, means that it can access all of our funds, withdraw them, and there is no guarantee that we can recover those funds. This is important to have. Uh, I, I would like now to spend the last few minutes to tell you a bit about Onis and our system of custody as a service. Uh, the idea of our custody service is to enable the companies to use all our infrastructure, all our guarantees, 
to their users on a simple and regulated way and in a safe way. And we are in charge of covering the regulations, covering the exchange, covering the custody. And we appify everything and we give it to you as a back end so that only you can access that and you can operate it. So this allows us to offer the custody service solving all the problems I mentioned before in a very easy way to any person or company who wishes to access the crypto environment. This product is already working and it's already integrated with banks and neobanks. So we're not speaking about something that is going to come in the future, but it's already there. So I do not have uh, any more time. I would like to thank you for your um participation. I would like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to tell you a bit more about ONIS. And I will be waiting for your comments and suggestions. I am open at any channel to uh, respond to your remarks. Thank you very much for your attention and hope to see you very soon. Nos quedamos con Let este dato que nos proporcionaba el consejero delegado de ONIS. Entidades como J.P. Morgan o Vanguard que activos en criptomonedas. En la mesa redonda en la que seguimos hablando de seguridad, como es el desarrollo de las monedas digitales. Es un placer de tener a Mariano Gutiérrez de la Policía Nacional. Es un comisionado de la Policía Nacional. Él nos presenta a los ponentes. Él va a moderar este panel y introducir a sus hablantes. Bien, saludos. Greetings. I am pleased to welcome to this roundtable on security as the backbone for the development of digital currencies within the Civil Virtual Summit, uh, focused on whether digital currencies will be mainstream. I'm Marcelino Gutierrez Rodriguez, Honorary Chief Commissioner of the uh, Spanish National Police, and I've been uh, designated by the organizers to chair this session. Throughout uh, my uh, career, I've uh, participated in activities to fight against organized crime, uh, drug trafficking, international uh, police cooperation, and uh, training linked uh, to the Spanish uh, National Ac uh, Police Academy. When we were designing this panel, we uh, made an effort to have the different uh, stakeholders uh, involved uh, in uh, investigating then in legal proceedings and international police cooperation insofar as this uh, activity is undoubtedly global and goes well beyond borders. So uh, we have uh, representatives uh, of uh, the uh, provincial uh, court uh, of uh, Odense. We have also heads uh, of uh, uh, telematic uh, and uh, also um, different operational units. Uh, we have uh, Europol and Interpol. Europol uh, would be the police of the 27 member states of the EU. Before I uh, give the floor to our speakers, uh, let me give you some uh, short reflections right now. Crypto uh, currencies or crypto assets have uh, features that make them special. First and foremost, we could uh, establish that these crypto assets uh, take advantage of this uh, generosity uh, mantra that wish to make the most of technology. These uh, networks allegedly with no personal interest that allow for transaction through uh, blockchains gives uh, this uh, feeling, but it is impossible to know who is behind this uh, scheme. Uh, secondly, this alleged transparency hides financial issues that has to do with the value that without social causes or uh, commercial policies are uh, not uh, regulated by uh, markets. And uh, we've seen a great volatility. We've seen how we've moved from 60,000 euros uh, down to 35,000 in the value of these uh uh, fluctuations happened in uh, market value and equity value operators and regulators would have done something about it. And thirdly, the experience uh, of uh, the um, 
police uh, forces and uh, the uh, uh, financial analyst uh, unit uh, have uh, focused on three topics that will be discussed uh, in this very panel session. First, uh, when it comes to uh, pyramid uh, fraud uh, we've uh, seen in the media uh, one uh, such a uh, fraud uh, that has uh, the Canary Islands and uh, Galicia uh, at the very top also we have ransomware express uh, uh, ransomware so the idea is uh, to uh, seize uh, data and this has happened uh, in the States for example in, in um, oil companies Company and uh, gas company, and uh, we need to also, in the third place, focus on uh, money laundering because this is a new format to transport money, and it is a way to make transactions uh, using public and private keys uh, to have uh, uh, money transferred from different areas. This is just by way of introduction. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Uh, Today, first, uh, we have uh, Mr. Antonio Piña Alonso, who is uh, a judge, president of the Provincial Court of Orense, a province in the northwest of Spain. He's a member of the Galicia High Court of Justice. He's been a member of one of the main associations of judges, the Professional Association. He's a professor at the Vigo University, has uh, uh, been teaching uh, private law and coordinates the Galician uh, uh, Legal Association in liaison with that of Barcelona. And and uh, he is a consultant and auditor at the European uh, Council, at the Council of Europe. And as uh, you all uh, know, uh, the uh, latter approved uh, the Budapest uh, Convention that has a lot to, to do with IT. He has given uh, many, many lectures and is. Uh, a uh, member of the Latin American uh, uh, network. Uh, then we have uh, Juan Antonio Rodriguez Alvarez de Seto Mayor. He is uh, currently the head of the Telematic Crimes Department of the Central Operation Unit of the Spanish Military Police. He's been around uh, doing this for a long time. He uh, founded uh, the Spanish Military Police uh, Cyber Terrorism Group back in 08, has represented Spain and the Spanish Military Police uh, in uh, these uh, topics. Uh, in, uh, the uh, Budapest Convention 2001 is part of Europol in, and Interpol. He's Lieutenant Colonel of the Spanish Military Police, uh, and he was graduate lieutenant in 97. He has a degree in the uh, Spanish uh, Army and has uh, a master's uh, degree and other postgraduate degrees, and then representing uh, the National Police, the Spanish National Police. Uh, she's the youngest. Uh, and, but has a fantastic uh, uh, curriculum and uh we're talking about Marlene Alvarez Vicente, group chief attached to the Central Computer Security Brigade of the Spanish National Police and has actively participated in numerous investigations and inquiries uh, having to do with the cryptocurrency. She uh, was uh, she, she uh, began uh, with this uh, uh, unit uh, in 2016. She's uh, training um, uh, core uh, members on cyber crime and uh, in investigations on uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, has a degree in law, has two masters on uh, cyber crime. Uh, then we have Fernando Fernandez Lázaro, head uh, of the Digital Forensic Laboratory at the Innovation Unit at Interpol in Singapore. Uh, it's one of the uh, offices of Interpol uh, farther afield, but he's uh, an expert in ICT, has uh, been uh, with the Spanish National Police for 20 years. He also worked in the technology crime unit and in the central operations and uh, cyber uh, security unit, vice president of the Latin American group on cyber crimes with Interpol, has um, an MA in uh, IT. I know this uh, MA very well because it's really demanding. It's on forensic uh, IT and the investigation of um, 
um, and also cyber crimes uh, organized by the University College of Dublin. Then uh, we have representing a Europol, Santiago Tellado, Chief Inspector. He is an expert in cyber crime in uh, 08. Uh, he is he works at the the SFS, uh, the Europol. He is a Chief Inspector. As I was saying, he worked uh, at uh, Interpol with the Europol and uh, teaches at the uh, Spanish National Academy. I also uh, took the MA that I mentioned earlier and is now completing another MA on intelligence in a very reputed uh, international uh, research uh, center, has uh, is different certifications in cryptocurrencies and is a member of international associations there. Curriculum is uh, quite long. This is just a snapshot without further ado. Let's uh, focus on our subject matter at hand. Uh, so I have some questions, and I would like to begin with uh, Mr. Antonio Piña, who is the president of the Provincial Court of Justice of Orense, again in the northwest of Spain. Uh, I would like to ask you, are cryptocurrencies uh, safe? Do they offer privacy to their uh, users? Uh, Mr. Piña, you have the floor. Good morning. I am delighted uh, to be part in uh, this uh, panel session with such experts since 2008, where the paper of the so-called uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was published uh, to date, 13 years have elapsed. And if we've uh, seen one thing is the, the uh, scarce uh, regulation on uh, cryptocurrencies, which is given way to this idea that cryptocurrencies uh, move in an unregulated space where there is anonymity, which in turn has uh, led to this uh, trend in crime that uh, they believe that it is more difficult to pursue unlawful actions where uh, money laundering is easier and where you can actually undertake in crime thanks to anonymity and the techniques to anonymize uh, IPs uh, using VPNs, uh, virtual machines, and whatnot. And I would like to underline to give you a uh, a little bit of a context that uh, in these 13 years, we have seen very few uh, modifications. One that I take it will be uh, discussed uh, in uh, this uh, uh, summit. Uh, we have uh, an EU directive passed in 08 on uh, AML uh, that was transposed uh, in the Spanish law sometime after. And we've seen that as regards legal activities, very few few uh, cases have ended up as a ruling. And if you look at, at uh, the JK's law collections, there are 50 uh, rulings at most, even by uh, the uh, Provincial uh, Court of Justice, there have been very few rulings that if you compare this uh, with the uh, criminal activity globally and in Spain, most uh, have to do not in the operation of the implementation of uh, cryptocurrencies, trading, negotiations, scams, uh, uh, lawful uh, seizing, uh, crimes that have to do with uh, cryptocurrency negotiation. And we've also seen in these rulings uh, that there's been a use by criminals of cryptocurrencies as method of payment and a way to mask uh, said payments. A very simple example would be the following. There is a second hand um, product uh, website. You see that there is uh, a, a, an apartment for rent, and uh, they use a platform that uh, uses cryptocurrency. So there are very few rulings. Uh, regardless of the uh, numerous uh, crimes. And there are legal issues uh, because this is all very new. For example, the uh, uh, cryptocurrency brokerage, uh, what role do they play? Can uh, they be taken to justice or not? So this in line with uh, your question, are they safe? Are they private? Uh, well, the cryptocurrency uh, generation, the uh, uh, production uh, of the, the latter when you th you think that a banknote uh, is safe when you think it cannot be uh, 
uh, counterfeited and it can be deposited in a bank. So cryptocurrencies can be saved. They're public uh, private keys, encryption, hash systems that make them safe. There have been some uh, problems uh, recently when in 2018 there were two uh, cryptocurrency thefts in the two main uh, crypto coins back then, uh, problems having to do with the uh, block uh, uh, chain size, uh, which uh, led to an irregularity. But we can say that cryptocurrencies are safe in uh, their production or issue. The problem is in their use and uh, negotiation. And also, is it private? Well, it's uh, pseudo-private because uh, a blockchain transaction includes public keys of the two parties involved and the object the, the uh, or the amount transferred. This uh, has given way to the following, since you don't have to provide uh, data of the uh, party is involved, uh, there is a feeling of uh, privacy because uh, the data were not there. It's difficult to pursue this, uh, but we've seen with years how a real investigation has greatly progressed and has determined that it is possible to group uh, the different transactions done by one individual. You can find data related to the person responsible for transactions, and you can even uh, uh, identify the individual, and uh, I, this has uh, had the following impact. We've seen seizures uh, of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, some very real dark side. For example, as an example, the ransomware uh, group uh, uh, that put pressure on uh, the uh, oil uh, production account, and then uh, we've seen how Bitcoin has been transferred to other uh, cyber coins that makes it more difficult to pursue and thereby reinforcing anonymity. So are they anonymous? Well, they're pseudo-anonymous. And in closing, because uh, I don't want to use up too much of your time, uh, there are uh, uh, recommendations in 09, recommendation number 16 uh, is giving way to a regulatory change uh, by states this recommendation it requires for any transaction uh, over one thousand dollars in amount to uh, identify the parties this uh, that has been uh, uh, implemented by m many states will change uh, the way cryptocurrencies uh, are managing this and it is going to affect uh, what the EU is now working on to articulate rules that allow to establish uh, regulations especially of uh, cryptocurrency uh, brokers and trading uh, platforms. I think this is uh, my time. Well, thank you. It's OK. I think that uh, uh, you've uh, hit the head, uh, nail on the head. Uh, you've uh, mentioned the recommendation uh, by Gaffey and uh, also the directive uh, that you've mentioned that uh, will set uh, the foundations. Okay. We're going to continue with Mr. Sotomayor. We're going to talk about the use of cryptocurrencies and criminal activity and what are the main crimes related to cryptocurrencies in Spain and worldwide. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for inviting us to talk about something as interesting as crypto coins or cryptocurrencies. First things first, this is a global issue, a global problem that requires global regulation to try and fight threats with uh, cryptocurrencies and challenges. The way criminals operate is becoming more and more sophisticated and more serious. And so I uh, would like to give you some examples from Spain, in particular in operations in which we participated in 2018. We had Operation Dryer. It is a main criminal case. We liaised with the Interpol and we uh, seized uh, more than 4.5 million euros worth of uh, bitcoins. 
This shows how cryptocurrencies can be used in a very serious criminal way. In this case, a Spanish family uh, became, you know, the family starring in Breaking, in Breaking Bad. Uh, this family were drug designers. Uh, they would sell the drugs on a portal which was not covered by the main browsers. They, they found their clients on the dark web. They sell their drugs through bitcoins, collecting loads and loads of bitcoins and cooperating with organizations in Eastern Europe. They laundered the cryptocurrencies. Why? Well, a representative from the criminal organization would come to Madrid and in a hotel, the cryptocurrency transfers were completed until the transfer was not uploaded on the blockchain blocks and the transfer was recorded for cryptocurrencies. When, when that entry was uh, registered, when the transfer was recorded, the person from Eastern Europe visiting Spain, staying at that hotel to do the, loan, the transfer, would call a person, in this case a Pakistani person, using Wahala, the Wahala system, which allowed him to give um, one million euro packages all you know in each transaction that's how the organization monetize or would monetize the money they obtained uh, the bitcoin system particularly is really closed and secluded and the weak uh, link of the change in bitcoin is in monetizing the currency make turning it into money because at present we don't have uh, systems to pay for services using cryptocurrencies or bitcoin in this case so that was a way of uh, laundering the money and that needs to be noted as uh, regards cryptocurrencies. Another case, another criminal case in which we also liaise with uh, Europol. Europol is to us a great, great partner to try and fight this type of uh, crime the criminal use of cryptocurrencies. And another case, which is also a reference point, we cooperated with Costa Rica uh, through the Interpol. In Costa Rica, one, um, a major entrepreneur and company owner was kidnapped. Ransom was uh, requested in bitcoins. The family before reporting the kidnapping to the police, paid uh, a million and a half uh, dollars in bitcoins to this criminal organization. The organization did not uh, answer messages after that. The Costa Rican police asked us to cooperate because they didn't have any signs yet to start the investigation. Our first question was how the family managed to collect uh, this type of currency so quickly because it's not easy to, to do either of the processes, buying or selling. They told us the company owner had a betting company using Bitcoin. So the uh, entrepreneur's company already handled a lot of Bitcoins and that's very important a uh, risk. It is risky to a person's life. It has been seen in different situations in which uh, exchanges are, occur person to person in portals where they meet to do the, their trade. And we, we know for sure that in these exchanges, the owner of the bitcoins is sometimes challenged or threatened or attacked. There is a way of making transactions anonymous uh, because a wallet cannot be traced until it is uploaded on the blockchain blocks and there is a third party able to link the wallet to a party or to a wallet cluster to who can be identified in this kidnapping case. We used a number of tools 
or from companies which uh, give us the information where many of those transactions go through uh, the main exchanges worldwide. We worked with the Costa Rican police. We gave them the information. We identified where different transactions with cryptocurrencies had gone through different exchanges. The Costa Rican police uh, contacted the betting houses there, and thanks, thanks to the application of uh, Know Your Client regulation, the Costa Rican police identified Costa Rican nationals related to organized crime and so started their investigation on this criminal network who had done the kidnapping. Uh, eventually, the person was arrested by the police in Spain, in Zaragoza. So this is one example. We have another case in Norway. In Norway, a person from a wealthy family, well, the grandmother was kidnapped and ransom was asked in Monero, another anonymous crypto coin. So these are the main uses which, as we can see, are not directly related to cybercrime. But in cybercrime, cryptocurrencies are a main driver, one of the main drivers for cybercrime, because it is a vehicle to pay for bribing, to pay for blackmailing, to pay for ransoms. It is being used to pay access uh, for uh, sexual child abuse, sexual abuse, and we can also see it in buying in the purchase of infrastructure related to the subsequent steps, uh, more serious steps of cyber crime, for instance, buying a hosting service as the WannaCry operation case or other operations, for instance, um, registering domains and servers related to political campaigns to launch fake news. We've seen how cryptocurrencies have been used to pay for all such uh, technological infrastructures that support political campaigns seeking to create uh, fake, fake news. So basically, this is the way the operation of these criminal procedures takes place and the cases in which we have participated, which we believe to be very, very serious, we need to have a global answer internationally. Thank you. Um, that's um, a bit of a conclusion indeed. Global answer to global problems, and I think that phrase will be repeated in, in more interventions. I would like to give the floor to Marlene Álvarez from the National Police of Spain. The question is about um, the cases in which the Nacional, eh, Policía Nacional has participated, in Spain's National Police. Yes, we, I would like to tell you about our experience in investigations related to the use of crypto coins. Having said so, there is still a belief that um, cyber currencies are equivalent to cyber crime, but that is not true. As the former uh, speaker said, um, this is a vehicle, a channel for crime, for you know, sexual abuse for children, for example, but also with ransomware attacks with high indices. And at present, the main payment method is with crypto coins. We could also refer to the famous police virus, which would end up in people's email to pay for the ransom, payment had to be done with crypto coins, another very uh, popular crime in the pandemic time when telework is common. And, and I have to tell you, many companies are not prepared uh, cybersecurity-wise cyber for telework. Many of the credentials of these companies' workers have been obtained by criminals illegally and sold in the black market. The way of paying for credentials is via crypto, cryptocurrencies. 
um, credentials are sold from all types of organizations, all types of companies, and payment is done with crypto coins. And you can you have a choice actually of crypto coins for payment. Another payment method which is relevant is for IPTV cases. Do you know what IPTV is? It's a pay-per-view television, international pay channel pay-per-view on the internet. This is booming as a criminal practice, actually, uh, because it's very profitable in Spain, particularly, which I, I, I shall talk about Spain. We have a lot of foreigners who live in Spain who want to see uh, their country's uh, television channels, and the supply is scarce. These organizations offer access to more than 7,000 international television channels in return for a uh, quite economical fee. Uh, the organizations with strong infrastructures ask for payment in crypto coins. In this case, I would like to refer to Operation Cristofan uh, in recent months. This investigation, this operation is important because crypto coins were used for payment, but also for laundering money. And this we discovered in the end of the investigation. The criminals had evolved, had learned. That these criminals came from an Iranian organization, though the leader was based in Barcelona. Subscriptions were first paid with a credit card. These cards were related to uh, Spanish companies directed by this gentleman in Spain, internet companies, web hosting companies, cloud computing companies. Uh, these companies would receive many uh, subscriptions every month and they, they would use that as a cover-up. When banks started to ask uh, for an explanation, where does this money come from, then they shifted to using online payment platforms. We have a lot of platforms whose uh, places of business, I should say, are in countries which are not particularly willing to cooperate with the police, to put it softly. Uh, they would use cryptocurrencies or crypto coins, which would be uh, moved forward onto blockchain wallets and then to Iran and then back to Spain on the grounds that these were donations by wealthy people, inheritance money, etc. This is important a case because the main uh, criminal, the organizer, um, had a very high standing uh, life. I, in fact, bought a vehicle which was 200,000 euros. And the, one of the la latest purchases, uh, buying a flat in Barcelona over a million euros, he paid for that with crypto coins. They looked for a notary public who would admit payment in cryptocurrencies, and that gave us the clue because most of the payment was with crypto coin. And uh, lately, uh, we've identified a fraud, a uh, currency investment fraud, which has become sort of widespread in Europe. This type of investment uh, fraud, investing in uh, digital currencies, is the result of a lack of knowledge and because today the banking system cannot offer a very high interest rate. These organizations, these criminal organizations, have taken advantage of lower interest rates to offer investment with 20% uh, interest. Uh, it's hard for people to believe that, but I tell you what, a lot of cases are reported, a lot of fraud is being reported. You know, people who know a little bit about uh, economy, you know, like uh, um, business studies students, you know, people who work in the field and who sometimes uh, pay up to 400,000 euros. How does this work? Um, on our website, 
uh, network pops up, uh, invest in crypto coins like uh, this famous, this celebrity person did. They give you a form, you fill it out, and an assumed broker calls you and tries to convince you to invest like uh, 300 euros. Then they show you dedicated websites with uh, really sophisticated charts and they show you, you know, this is your investment, this is how it will grow over a very short period of time. And then they invite you to keep on investing uh, small quantities and then you end up in a third on a third website where money is invested at a much higher level with transfers with using uh, crypto coins and then they vanish you know the victim when he or she tries to get the money back her money back or his money back he is given excuses yes you have to pay for this money because this is tax and then we'll give you your money back it's a bit sad because some victims, you know, uh, have put all their savings into that account. So I, I suggest, you know, you, everybody should be very, very aware not to use these brokers. Now, this is a bit of a summary of what we do. Okay, so... Uh, I would like to go back uh, to these uh, pyramid schemes, and the, the judge here knows this back in my days. Uh, all of these were very famous, albeit they were not uh, digital. So, in a nutshell, the use of a cryptocurrency together with digital and virtual coins is an impressive, uh, explosive uh, cocktail and it's going to be uh, difficult to investigate, uh, I guess. Anyway, let's uh, move on to our second uh, block, although we're really behind schedule. I would like to discuss uh, tools or instruments uh, for investigation uh, purposes. Uh, I would like to begin uh, with Fernando. Fernando Lázaro from Interpol, uh, the forensic uh, tools uh, used in uh, inquiries or uh, investigation. You have the floor, uh, Mr. Fernández. Well, I will try to be brief to uh, stick to the time available. Undoubtedly, these days uh, when we undertake in an investigation where we suspect that cryptocurrencies are involved, it is necessary to perform a forensic analysis of digital devices uh, that the suspects uh, use. Currently, this we carry information with us on uh, mobile phones and uh, having access to these phones is at the essence in order to solve some of these investigations. Indeed, uh, phones are increasingly uh, more and more complicated to access. Uh, it is true that uh, criminals uh, try to use uh, those models where encryption is tighter, but we need to use all of the tools at our disposal to uh, perform uh, this forensic analysis and uh, extract as much information as possible from devices. So we suggest uh, in this sense to develop regular expressions uh, that uh, allow for the search of uh, uh, passwords uh, and keys uh, used by criminals to identify where those uh, bitcoins uh, may be, also to identify the uh, recovery passwords, those uh, keywords that allow uh, us to recover uh, passwords. Uh, the global complex uh, at Interpol, at, uh, in Singapore even, if we're very far east, if the okay, earth was flat. But anyway, um, we published some guides that may prove helpful when it comes to performing forensic analysis, the digital uh, forensic analysis that we have, cre we have uh, created a guide uh, 
for uh, investigators to take uh, the first steps to collect evidence, what devices might be especially uh, useful to uh, gather uh, evidence and proof are Brothers, uh, at the uh, Innovation Center at Interpol have uh, published a specific guide on uh, the uh, seizure of uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, and uh, they recommend, because we make recommendations, bear in mind that uh, countries have their own legislations, they give us recommendations on how to prepare uh, our wallets uh, where we're going to transfer uh, the assets in, in which uh, that we may be able to confiscate. We need to see the means we need to use to be anonymous so that criminals cannot recover uh, those uh, those uh, coins. And uh, all of this is included in these uh, guides that I've mentioned. They are available to uh, uh, police and security forces through an Interpol platform called the Global Knowledge Hub, which sets out to share knowledge from experts in this realm of uh, cyber currency, and uh, it allows uh, to upload documents, open discussions, uh, ask questions in a trusted environment, because uh, the knowledge and techniques uh, that we use, uh, we don't want uh, others uh, to know. So that's why we try to keep this as uh, closed, as tight as possible. Uh, so that there will be no leak of uh, that uh, information. So this is the importance of uh, analyzing devices when we can, and even if this means uh, using uh, techniques uh, uh, that are known but uh, updated and uh, Tweaked. Well, thank you, Fernando. Guides are very important because uh, they prove helpful to police forces in this endeavor. It's quite uh, novel and uh, it's not easy to train uh, professionals. I uh, would like to ask uh, Mr. Santiago Tellado to um, come in next, uh, representing the uh, National Police and uh, Europol. So, Santiago. Uh, Tellado, tell us uh, your take on cryptocurrency. Well, thank you, Marceliano, for giving me the floor. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for having me, uh, for representing, uh, for, uh, for, for having uh, different uh, members of the Spanish uh, judiciary from uh, police forces and uh, national and international police forces. Much of what I was planning on saying to uh, answer your question has already been said. And uh, I think that this is uh, the cryptocurrency nature at work because we're facing a global phenomenon and there are very few regional differences when it comes to the use of cryptocurrencies. There may be differences as regards rules and regulations, and uh, this is seen as a vulnerability by criminals uh, when they use uh, cryptocurrencies for unlawful purposes. But if we go back to your question on uh, tracing cryptocurrencies, I would like to underline two things. First, which has been uh, mentioned earlier, has to do with the pseudo-anonymity character of uh, these currencies. When it started, everybody thought that not having to to uh, produce uh, personal details when uh, performing uh, transfers uh, conveyed anonymity, and uh, these uh, individuals uh, would not be identified. And well, it, it's always a bit difficult to grasp certain things that are virtual, but there's. Uh, 
a, um, an analogy that I use uh, at the university often to explain this pseudo-anonymity to my students. And it's like when you're uh, going out for a walk uh, in the street with a ski mask because these technologies use a blockchain. It's public. One's uh, transaction, the transfer has been uh, done. It, it's irreversible. It's there and visible for one and all. So it's like uh, looking out the window and watching people go by. Well, among uh, th th those uh, um, pedestrians, you'll see people wearing a ski mask. And you don't know who they are in principle. Obviously, uh, police uh, inquiries, uh, national and international investigations, uh, when these uh, cryptocurrencies are used, uh, focus on removing face masks, uh, ski masks, that would be. Uh, to see if uh, those uh, cryptocurrencies uh, have been used for uh, illegal purposes. So this is a, a, a motive to go around removing ski masks. And secondly, it's all about the type of currency. If you ask uh, around, I'd say that uh, almost everybody, if you ask uh, what uh, cryptocurrency do you know, I think that almost everybody Everybody will say Bitcoin. It's uh, the uh, number one uh, such currency. But there are other uh, crypto coins around with this uh, kind of technology and uh, using this uh, crypto privacy pretext uh, perform uh, transfers in a more pick uh, way and uh, tracing them is more difficult. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I believe that you're uh, muted, Marceliano. Oh, uh, uh, would you want to mention anything else? Uh, that was what I was trying to say. I, I just uh, discussed uh, traceability. We're talking about uh, tracing. Okay, uh, that, that's uh, that's um, been uh, addressed. Uh, let's uh, have uh, shorter answers, please, uh, to the president of the provincial court of Orense. Uh, I would like to discuss uh, the um, difficulty of uh, the judicial inquiry, not only the police uh, inquiries, but the judicial inquiry you mentioned uh, that we need uh, perhaps a regulation in the use uh, in the case of uh, cryptocurrency traders and uh, brokers. Uh, how does all of this uh, affect uh, judicial inquiries? Inquiries. Well, we discriminate between police uh, actions by police uh, forces and the use of computer forensic techniques uh, from the judicial inquiry itself, whereby it is not only necessary to know who is guilty, uh, but uh, proof evidence has to be obtained legally and uh, it has uh, to be challenged uh, and uh, when cryptocurrency is used as a method of payment uh, we see very common denominators including uh, problems with international cooperation for example uh, we're trying to improve uh, the different uh, instruments uh, available and uh, to boost international cooperation because what we've been doing thus far is not uh, uh, effective uh, because uh, if you ha need to uh, send out uh, a uh, a, a rogatory letter or, or whatever takes long. The Budapest uh, Convention establishes uh, the necessary to uh, preserve data. And uh, so, so th these uh, judicial inquiries require strong international cooperation, and there has to be uh, legal standardization. This is uh, what the um, Budapest Convention uh, pursues and uh, we need to make uh, certain regulations more homogeneous if we want to uh, go after a crime we the crime it has to be a crime in uh, the 
country uh, where the crime has been originated and the country where the criminal is uh, at. So we need uh, audited uh, tools and instruments. Uh, the reports uh, obtained uh, needs to undergo challenging. Uh, so we need training to uh, for judges uh, and as uh, regards uh, judicial inquiries on cryptocurrencies uh, as per AML rules there's a need to make sure uh, that uh, traders and brokers uh, in be uh, in, in, investigated in such a way that you can distinguish between uh, li uh, currency that is legal uh, or, or, or currency that is used uh, for legal purposes and for illegal purposes. So we need regulation. We need uh, uh, rules that uh, allow for this decentralized activity. Uh, enables us to know who's involved, who the parties are. This is a huge global challenge. We need to limit anonymity in these uh, transactions and these transfers and maybe uh, perhaps not final because uh, cyber criminals always look for uh, sidetracks uh, and loopholes. And But uh, anyway, what we apply to uh, physical cash, we need to be able to apply in an adapted manner to uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, but uh, we definitely need to regulate cryptocurrencies. Uh, the latter are not considered money per se, coins uh, as such, and this is a, a problem why. Uh, and I think that th that is necessary. We've advanced uh, a lot. I remember back in 2012, 2013, and my colleague from Interpol uh, can tell you, we've advanced uh, in tracing, in investigating, in uh, uh, their ransomware uh, gangs uh, uh, that uh, thought that the cryptocurrencies were safe now realize that it's not that safe. So we need more regulation and uh, improve uh, tracking and tracing systems. So this will lead uh, to a good uh, end. Thank you. I don't know if the representatives of the police would like to add something or comment on investigation problems, the issues they come across in the work. Um, Juan or Malen. Okay, can you hear me now? We face many problems, numerous problems. I suppose the president of the National Hearing Office also knows about a lot of problems. One of these issues has to do with exchanges in China or the USRR, Russia. Uh, I suppose they have uh, the, uh, you know they have the, conf the Budapest Convention which allows them to create almost autonomous digital states and that puts an end to our capacity to track down things to trace the use of cryptocurrencies uh, our monitoring capacity is uh, well known by these criminals. They know perfectly what we can do. I can generate a cryptocurrency wallet and it is not known until it is uploaded on the blocks of blo blockchain. So I am the only one who knows it is mine. We've seen cases such as the North Petra Ramsar case Ram, Ramson uh, cares, in which payment was done by a Russian who lived in Barcelona when we went to his place with a warrant, with a search uh, order. Uh, he told us he was just a service provider 
a mixer, in other words, he would mix or combine transactions in cryptocurrencies with other currencies. And we were able to identify one of his wallets he would use for these cryptocurrencies mixes and we had another problem is not only the fact that this person is anonymous uh, and doesn't need a, an exchequer with uh, mixer services we have the problem that these services are not regulated and that's what they do they mix uh, transactions using hundreds of wallets which makes things very very difficult traceability wise in other words The model, the ecosystem of cryptocurrencies has been conceived for an anonymous use and that's our major problem when we try to persecute this type of uh, crime. Thank you, Marlene. Concerning Bitcoin transfers, uh, what are the problems these transfers involve? With Bitcoin transfers, sometimes we get calls. I made a transfer and I want to reverse it. I want to withdraw the money I transferred. Well, it depends. If you use a particular bit chain, you may get lucky, but with these exchanges, they, they pull transfers together and then emit them. Then they issue them. Most of them, I should say, do cooperate with uh, security forces in, in English and with in Spain too, and they can stop it. But if the transfer was completed by the user's personal wallet, you cannot go back. You cannot reverse it. The, are these types of investigations a challenge to the police when they become international? All exchanges in Spain, uh, operating in Spain, are not based in in Spain. They are all somewhere else outside Europe. So we need, you know, specific legal procedures and requirements, and they are also present in uh, the internet's digital havens. So it's hard to get information. We do inf we get information from um, rightful sources. You can do preventive blocking of transfers, but you have to work in hand in hand with courts, courts of justice, because you are going to have problems. Um, and criminals do know what uh, exchanger they have to resort to. Of course, they're not going to use the strictest ones, you know, those which are uh, tough, those who are tough, they would rely on softer ones. And then the money is sent to the countries we mentioned earlier, which makes cooperation almost impossible or very complicated, I should say. Uh, Interpol. The Interpol, um, the question is very general. How can the Interpol help countries in their investigations about crypto coin cases? Well, with the Interpol, the public image we, we have, you know, the image of our helicopters, you know, a landing and, well, it's not particularly true, I should say. What we do basically is uh, making contacts with central Interpol offices to make contact with all member states, the countries I mentioned at the beginning, to encourage that type of collaboration and contact, our new technology laboratory and cyber security laboratory here organize a task force whose experts exchange knowledge. Well, before the pandemic, they would have uh, regular face-to-face -face meetings and they would explore, you know, solutions, um, study challenges to try and improve or create a roadmap on the improvement of capabilities and skills with the police in these countries related to these uh, cyber security crimes. I would also like to mention that from here, uh, training activities have also been 
implemented our virtual training rooms, as we call them. In these training sessions, we tackle subjects that are very much in vogue at present because uh, the countries ask us to do that or because they are relevant to them. These um, virtual meetings have also taken place last year, dealing with subjects such as the use of public tools for traceability, uh, for following up the roots of bitcoins sold, or more theoretical sessions such as quantum computing and how it can affect the security of uh, virtual digital currencies. Uh, that's what we do from here to support the countries. Uh, thank you. Santiago. Uh, an international view. What are the challenges of security forces to try and fight cybercoin crimes? Well, um, many measures have already been described and, and many problems such as the lack of legislation. Obviously, the phenomenon is global. There are many jurisdictions involved. All of them are sort of biased. They're all particular, economically speaking, you know, and which makes it difficult to ask for data, to request data in a police investigation. We are faced with exchanges, basically, who, well, in the European Union, the exchanges in the European Union do not observe the money laundering directive. And uh, so they, they apply uh, the know your client policy, though, and so they can give us the information. They give us the information. But in other jurisdictions, when law, when the law does not allow for that, we are definitely in trouble. As the police commented earlier, the fact that these transactions are anonymous uh, hinders police investigation. At the beginning, we talked about that pseudo-anonymous uh, nature, but I would like to emphasize the depersonalization aspect too. If criminals go to a mixer, go to an exchanger, to a place where we can ask for data, at least we have an investigation Avenue. The problem comes with certain platforms, financial service platforms, where transactions are completed without intermediaries, you know, between the buyer and the seller directly um, via, via a transfer where more automated systems are in place. On the dark net, there is a platform, a platform called Telebond. And basically, by being part of a group, of an instant messaging um, site through, you know, not dealing directly with the drug dealer, but you can pay virtually with your crypto coins um, when the police finds out about these transactions, there's nobody to ask data from. That's possibly one of the main challenges ahead. Thank you. Uh, would some of you like to take the floor? We have three, four minutes. Uh, maybe it's time for conclusions to close the session. Uh, President, a final recommendation on your part? I agree with um, everybody. As um, was said earlier, I hope the amendment of the convention sought by Russia and China is not taken any further. And everything this we discuss is very much the reality we live in. Okay, thank you. Uh, possibly, um, 
yes, it's, it's time to draw some conclusions. We talked about many aspects and many subjects. We will collect all the contents and circulate them. The goal is to continue having this summit in forthcoming editions, and um, we will have uh, summaries for all of them. But my takeaway message is as follows, a global problem, a global solution. We talked about the lack of legislation. We talked about auditing these instruments, uh, international cooperation, police uh, cooperation, and how difficult it is to apply it in this field. And um, obviously, the anonymous nature makes it very, very difficult, together with the involvement of people from all over the world in these criminal activities. Um, and of course, Europol and Interpol are main agencies to fight these crimes. Thank you very much for participating. I hope we offered uh, some light, we shed some light on these matters. As the President said at the beginning, there are very few rulings, very few uh, judgments, so there is no doctrine. But slowly but surely, there will be more. Uh, the Guardia Civil and the National Police are experienced in these operations, though with uh, limited focus on payment as a result of bribing and using these uh, currencies to pay for bribes. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you in the next edition. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We have just listened in this roundtable discussion about security, how cryptocurrencies can facilitate online crimes such as portals on child abuse, digital kidnapping and financing of criminal groups. The speakers said that the criminal use of cryptocurrencies requires international cooperation agreements and standardization of laws. At this digital coin and European financial system Seville virtual summit, we want to invite you to reflect on geopolitics and large digital currencies. We will now start with a lecture of Juan Maria Nin, board member of Société Générale de Banque and chairman of Morabank. Muchas gracias. Thank you to the Council of Seville for hosting this Digital Coin Virtual Summit. I think it is an excellent initiative. It is virtual, which means that it may turn face to face at some point. Uh, I love Seville. Seville is a beautiful city, and it's, my, it's going to be my first visit in short. This time is online, but I hope it will be face-to-face -face in the future. And this introduction has to do with the subjects I'm going to address in a way. Um, I was talking to the organizers before, and um, when I, you know, just today or the day before when I read the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, you see the news, and it is so very interesting. You also see opinion articles in the press, really sound articles, but very ideological. To me, that is extraordinarily interesting. Let's begin with the points I'm going to address. Point number one, the concept. What is this? This is uh, a market, $1.3 trillion, a uh, trillion in Anglo-Saxon terms, which is uh, a lot more than the dollar bills issued at this moment in time, according to some people. So, it is definitely a big, big thing. 
What is this all about? Well, it is also a classic mining uh, thing. It reproduces uh, mining the way we knew it to date. And what is more important, the virtual side or the physical side? Both realities are exactly uh, real, exactly equally real. Crypto uh, currencies have uh, support blockchain. Blockchain is a universal ledger book with 2,800 million uh, payments per year in bitcoins, something which is definitely eye-catchy for the press, with uh, a huge number of opaque movements too. And lately, unfortunately, 348 million ransomware. I have read in the Spanish press and in abroad in Colonial Pipe the reaction of Tesla immediately after the ransomware attack. So what is it? What is it? Point number one, what is happening? Something that has to do with freedom, with liberties, People, uh, mankind or humankind, and I'm now going back to physical reality, uh, over a few thousand years have managed to build what, this, what we call spontaneous realities, namely a company, a town council, they did not exist and now they exist. Money is an, a, spontaneous, a spontaneous reality, it did not exist in former times and at a given time it appeared in the form of wheat or other bulk um, products and it then turned into actual money and money deposits. Cryptocurrencies are they money or not? They are a payment means, a payment method, and they are value deposits, assets. You may say, not really, not that much, but we do identify those three criteria with cryptocurrencies. And if that is the case, if it is money, what's new about it? My food for thought is as follows. Cryptocurrencies are nothing new. They are money, and money is millions of years old. But uh, in society, in today's society, we seem to believe it is something new. Not at all. Cryptocurrencies are money, nothing new under the sun. However, there is a great new invention blockchain. What comes first, crypto or blockchain? To me, something is very clear. The concept was there, but the formulation of money as a cryptocurrency could not exist without blockchain, the breakthrough. We are then faced with a very interesting paradox. The combination of both results in a phenomenon which has immediate impacts in terms of social organizations, in terms of value on freedom on the one hand. You may say I'm no longer forced to use uh, sterling pound or euro or dollar. And then society and particularly the younger generation start operating internationally. If that is the case, the battle is an ideological one. And that is new. Partly it is new. The ideological battle is partly new. But unless we remember three or four points, we cannot make much progress. Let's remember Bretton Woods at the end of the Second World War, 1944, and Keynes' proposal about an international currency, one that could ensure a better balance, etc. Keynes 
um, suggested um, his currency or uh, an international currency. And then Mr. White's, Mr. White in the US, United States said not at all the international currency is the dollar because we won the war in 1971. Nixon said, OK, that's all fine. The dollar is fine. But there was still a link bit with the gold pattern, gold pattern being synonymous with the Bitcoin now. So in the end, I shall turn money or the currency into a piece of paper. This meaning there was a need for political trust for the government in office and the state. And something that causes intellectual restlessness. Hayek, in 1976, uh, suggested to finish the monopoly of states instrumentalized by governments to move on to an international currency called Ducado, Hayek's coin or currency. But that was not it. In 1969, the International Monetary Forum um, launches new proposals and then the ECU coin with the European Union, the, the European Economic Community. And finally, the bomb in 2019. Facebook decided, together with 27 large world companies, to launch the pound. What changed in the dialogue in trying to have globalization on the one hand versus political control? Well, the pound issued by private companies with a huge potential of million users, 30% of the world's actual population. In other words, um, this would be equivalent to that political power. And, and this could be further discussed, but very quickly, after Facebook announced its coin, very rationally, Build and based on Hayek's approaches, we saw uh, Trockenberg wearing a tie in the Senate, you know, and the media. And finally, the withdrawal of the proposal due to unbearable pressures. And so it became obvious that the subject underlying cryptocurrencies is uh, freedom versus the current order. Cryptocurrencies are very interesting, but they pose systemic risks to financial stability. They are also a risk concerning control of uh, sovereign, sovereign debts. There are also a question mark as to their effect upon inflation and deflation. Cryptocurrencies also open a very interesting loop, um, a loop in the progress and developments of history because it goes back to money as an existing thing but being supported by blockchain and for the future opening very interesting avenues. It is also an ideological battle and therefore Facebook withdrew its currency without the G7 group and the G20 group having to meet to coordinate digital payments. So all these previous currencies failed, but today, and well, we see it every day, actually, on Expansion, Vox Populi, and other newspapers, we see an explosion, a boom of cryptocurrencies. And therefore, this results in an 
unstoppable wave of financial innovation which requires thorough evaluations of many aspects. It is a collective decision process. And so the appearance of all these cryptocurrencies reflects all the sensitive issues uh, behind the topic. Um, we are here today in this conference, and we need to look ahead of us, because if this is a political battle, an ideological battle, a power battle, then who is going to win the battle of ideas? I have an opinion about that, about the winner. In the end, progress is unstoppable, new ideas uh, win, and therefore in history we will see that cryptocurrencies will transform things and the status quo. It is true, too, that we need to rely on policy makers, theorists, um, ideologists to analyze this. The emergence of a relatively new phenomenon, public blockchain technology, which uh, obviously obliges us to ask and, re and pose political questions and economic questions. The battle between protection and controllers is also there. If we look ahead of us, I shall mention two more points. This is happening in a very interesting context, a new lateral factor the debt cycle, uh, the borrowing cycle, and inflation. Does it have an impact on developments in coming quarters? I uh, can't go much further in the long run, I can't. The, the debt cycle, the inflation cycle, of course it does. Our memory is short-lived, but if we remember the great deflect, deflection and inflation in between wars in the United States and in Germany, those were lessons learned by the collective unconscious. The perception that 2008, the year 2008, is the ending to a very long cycle following Bretton Woods and the new monetary theory, the new monetary management of the crisis uh, have given us um, some time breaks, particularly in Europe, for structural reforms. But the threat is there, the borrowing debt, uh, sorry, aspect and threat is there. Let me remind you what the value of money is. And perhaps with an interesting money payment and with interesting value aspects, um, Nixon's uh, proposal was a checkmate point. But will they be uh, an instrument for power? I don't know. I don't know. We live, we live amidst mystery. The, and to finish with, let me say there are two angles to analyze. The first one is uh, crypt coins from the point of view of technology at Wall Street. What happens when large corporations start supporting the phenomenon of cryptocurrencies with the United States having an interest and acting quickly when this shifts from uh, Wall Street to EHAP, to the high street. They are not yet at the high street. They are not at Paseo de Gracia, Barcelona. You can't buy a pair of jeans in Paseo de Gracia in Barcelona with, uh, with uh, crypto coins. But I do have a card which would allow me to do it. It is easier to buy things on the internet. There you have a vector. And then the other very interesting vector is how political reactions are articulated. Uh, we will see this in the coming months. 
with uh, cryptocurrencies between central banks. So my question is, a uh, cryptocurrency from a central bank is really a uh, Cryptocurrency, is it supported in a public registry such as blockchain or is it a fiat money um, technically supported by a new technology but not a cryptocurrency? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Juan María Nin planteaba Juan María Nin was saying that cryptocurrencies may be a political power element. He related it to the digital currency that Facebook foresees to launch. We will continue to speak about geopolitics with a dialogue moderated by Enric Tintoré, an economic journalist. He will introduce all its participants. Hello, good morning. We are today with Rafael Catalá, former Minister of Justice between 2014 to 2018. He's a lawyer and he's now the chairman of the Mediation uh, Center at the Chamber of Spain. We also have Miguel Otero. He's the lead researcher of Elcano Royal Institute. Good morning. Good morning. We are going to discuss the impact of cryptocurrencies in geopolitics in order to analyze where the status quo can change. The great expansion uh, of the main cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin, is concerning all the monetary authorities and countries because they see there may be a possibility for expansion that is huge and which could even rival the big currencies, mainly the dollar, and reduce its uh, predominance in the international arena. What is your opinion about it? Who would like to start? Well, just to start, because we have some time to speak about several topics. But from my point of view, the emergence of digital currencies or cryptos has generated a disruptive effect that has modified traditional models, in this case, in the financial systems and in the traditional coins and notes, as we understand. And I mean, it is disruptive because in modern societies and economic and social systems in the 21st century, there's a fundamental value, which is security and legal certainty and the trust that is inferred from the fact that we all know the rules and we all respect the rules. However, cryptocurrencies have come here to change this status quo and to generate a new standard. So everything that is new, that is groundbreaking, generates concerns and uncertainty. And this is interesting for me in the sense that how this situation can, however, be reasonably regulated in order to reinforce legal certainty, legal security, and trust, and become a positive factor and not uh, as, a, as a concerning element in this initial stage, which is what the main characteristic right now, the uncertainty, the threats, etc. That Those are the main characteristics. But I believe we can make it um, become a, a factor of trust and development. Now, Miguel Otero, this is your turn. Well, I believe that the first thing we have to say is that Bitcoin is not money. It is a payment system. It is a new technology which helps to send money from one place to the other, to have a decentralized uh, accounting and more transparent accounting, but money in its three functions, which is means of payment, uh, 
unity of accounts and deposit of value, I believe Bitcoin is not in any of these three functions. As a means of payment, you cannot buy almost anything with a Bitcoin. As a unit of account, we give it a value in terms of dollars or euros, so there are very few contracts that are issued with Bitcoins, uh, except for very small uh, and minority uh, circles in the cyberspace and people who are trying to find an opaque system. And now we see it fell considerably. It has a huge volatility. So even the idea that this could be a kind of virtual gold is, for me, quite contested. So to be a bit more provocative, it is a bit of a digital uh, tulip. You can see it as an asset. It is something that the authorities wish to regulate because there are certain risks attached to it. But even with the authorities I speak about it, they believe if they regulate it too much, they give it credibility so more people will believe it is an asset where they can invest. Therefore, in general, I believe the most interesting thing of the blockchain technology, which can be used in other sectors, uh, is at its core. But to start the discussion, we should uh, make it very clear that this is not money, it is an asset, and it entails high speculation. Do you have something to say, Mr. Rafael? Yes, I I agree with Miguel and with his reflection, but it's also true that even if it's not a means of payment by itself, as a unit of account, its transformation into euro can be used as a means of payment. So there's a certain friction there because you may have an, uh, an account where you can pay in this system so you can have uh, interesting results. I believe it is very interesting what Miguel has just said about the convenience or not uh, for regulation. It's a certain paradox because if we regulate, we give it more credibility to something that we really do not wish to grant this credibility or certainty. But I think it's a duty in the terms that cryptocurrencies will end up being established and for the general interest that this could generate in the future, what I do claim, and I think it's appropriate, is to have a clear regulation, a reasonable regulation that is adapted to cryptocurrencies, but to the extent that we see even with marketing campaigns, with ads, we can see it is more and more uh, part of our daily lives. And the authorities cannot leave a side of this reality. So there's a need to generate trust and certainty for the citizens towards a new element that is appearing on the economy and which is having a higher impact on the day. So it's important to regulate it. I do not believe that the regulators, the governments, should decide to give credibility or not to the cryptocurrencies. That is something that the citizens will do. But they have to make sure that the operations where cryptocurrencies are involved, they should have all the guarantees and there is no scam, there is no option for fraud. And that is the duty of the public powers because this is very innovative and it requires certain regulation. If you allow me, just to come into the discussion with Miguel, the authorities, financial authorities, are quite concerned because this is only growing and it is more and more used. Even the United States have authorized the use and the trade and the payment in certain uh, retail sectors with Bitcoin. And what is most concerning under my point of view, I don't know whether you share this point of view, is that we have Bitcoin, this unit of account. 
it has an important capacity for payment and we don't know in what hands it is. We still don't know um, where it is, who is behind the scenes, who is controlling it in the end of the day. And in this dependence, theoretical dependence, there, it, we have the main risk because if you wish to regulate, that is the main risk. What's your opinion about it? I think there are several questions here. It's true that there are some authorities and some sectors, economic sectors, that believe that there is certain business here or certain possibilities of use in this technology, and they are defending it. But from the historic point of view, my analysis is the following. There has always been private quasi-money in the past. That is, this is not recent. And when we have these quasi types of money, this is usually a time where credibility and legitimacy of the authorities is under question. So there's a parallel here. The money has to do with sovereignty, with political power, with what Rafael said, with trust that we have in this political power in order to support this money or this currency. What Bitcoin is actually showing is that it is not a surprise or just a sheer coincidence because it emerged in 2008 precisely in the financial crisis under the premise to create a monetary power or at least a monetary area or space out of the power of the political authorities, out of the central banks, etc. So that is the reflection uh, in my view. I think the impact of the Bitcoin is more psychological. It's more about saying, OK, we have important problems in our political systems and the assault to the capital is the biggest proof of this resistance and, and reluctancy to trust the political powers. But it is not so much uh, the journey of a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. Mr. Rafael, any observation? Yes, I do trust or I share your view in the sense that there are certain elements around crypt, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, specifically Bitcoin, that are against stability, security, and trust, which are the values of the 21st century democracies, because it's a bit dark. Who is there? Where is the Bitcoin? In what hands it is lying? How can these be materialized? Is there any security? that I can recover the value in a legal tender? Well, these kind of uncertainties are, of course, against democratic values of trust and transparency. On the other hand side, it doesn't help in this sense to have the, this extreme volatility of cryptocurrencies. You can see the valleys in the pricing. It is huge. Uh, either going up or down. So security in terms of an investment is also low. So in the end of the day, I am quite interesting, interested because of my more legal profile or regulatory profile. We need to be able to provide the citizens trust and confidence in these terms. This is an asset. So it has certain volatility indexes, and you need to be aware of that. You need to know, and therefore you will then decide where to invest. In terms of trust, the world has changed a lot. Some years ago, when we started uh, e-commerce, online commerce, we had certain difficulties in order to identify where was the operator of the e-commerce, uh, where was the uh, operation really taking place when there was no physical person uh, doing the transaction. So we solved it 
And we provided trust and transparency to the e-commerce, which is now uh, really a great part of our lives. And in that sense, we should also be able, I mean, governments and parliaments and central authorities to establish trust and convey messages to the citizens so that they know that these assets are there, you can operate with them, but there is no fraud, there is no possibility for scam, and there is no uncertainty except for its value, for the value itself. It is just about the price it could get, but it is not, uh, there could not be a fraud. Do you see any geopolitical impact that can have this increase of crypto coins, cryptocurrencies that could possibly change the influence of political and monetary focuses at international level? Well, I believe that I wanted to say that Bitcoin has a big problem, which is the high use of electricity, of energy that you need for mining to get more Bitcoins. The mining of Bitcoins nowadays consumes as much energy as the whole country of Argentina. We have a great problem here, very big, of carbon footprint in the production of Bitcoins. And there, this leads me to China. China is one of the places where they were most mining in, also in Inner Mongolia. And China is trying to decrease this in a way. But I think the most interesting thing is to see how cryptocurrencies have led us to the debate. And as we were speaking about before, about Libra, Facebook coin, it has led us to the debate on the digital coin of central banks, the digital currencies of the central banks. And I think here there is an interesting debate because the Chinese central bank is supposed to be the most advanced one, and they had made a pilot test in introducing their sovereign digital coin. And China, therefore, they use mobile phones uh, increasingly. Uh, they use them very much, and they have telco companies and also online commerce companies, which are huge. Tencent, Alibaba, for example, the most known. And there may be China throughout their digital sovereign currency and the payment system they have and in the online uh, field, well, they are all around the world. Maybe they can, they are, will decrease their coin and maybe interna internationalize even more due to their uh, online payment networks. And that would be against the power of the dollar, right? Well, not only. The debate right now in Europe is precisely that one, that the European Central Bank is already thinking on uh, issuing a di Euro digital because much of the competence of the international currencies will be in the digital sphere. And we're speaking about digital monetary areas. And China there, uh, or the Chinese coin can have bigger markets in other places, even where place those places where the euro is dominant right now. So that can be a concern. So you're saying that China is a concern in this field, right? But was not United States mistaken by banning Facebook, a United, uh, United States uh, company, uh, launching their cryptocurrency? I'm sure it would have overcome Bitcoin. It would be the dominant one in the world under the umbrella of the United States. Was that not a mistake of the United States by banning this cryptocurrency? What do you think? Well, in my opinion, in any geopolitical analysis of the current world, uh, needs to be around two axes, United States and China. Any analysis, economical, analysis, industrial, innovation, technology, financial, 
uh, we need to understand the world in this dichotomy and in this conflict in terms of tension, not of aggressiveness. But in this field of cryptocurrencies, in my opinion, as I, as I said before, it's not so much about banning or not banning, but we need to put things in order, uh, activities, so activities that are reasonable, uh, legitimate, transparent, that give trust to the users. And so any governmental activity that goes beyond that, a ban, for example, I think it's an error. Conceptually, and also in terms of geopolitical analysis, this tension, tension between the United States and China, uh, from Europe, we, we are now a secondary actor, and we need to analyze them to understand what's happening in the world. There are new moments of innovation, and for that we need to analyze and observe the two big poles of the geopolitical dynamics in the world. And in this sense, banning that a big economical operator such as Facebook could uh, issue their own crypto coin. Well, it has weakened Facebook, of course, but also the American economy in this very moment and in this volatile market uh, as the crypto assets is. Well, I have a different view here. I believe that, as Rafael said before, we live more and more this geopolitical rivalry due to the crisis uh, 10 years ago in the pandemic, the state has come again with power. And it's not a surprise that United States even, and the Biden administration goes is going already this way, they need all uh, assets of their economy, of their society to compete against the China challenge. And for that, you need the state, a big solid state, which coordinates or articulates this power uh, so give the to give the possibility to a com private company such as Facebook Facebook to issue something which would be considered as quasi money because if actually Facebook with the more than 2,000 million users all these users step by step start thinking that uh, language uh, money is a language and we use language constantly to calculate value when we see something we like we immediately think how much it is and the unit uh, that we use normally we use the euro but our grandparents used the peseta for example to my grandfather they took that language from him and he died without really mastering this new language. So language is something we use to calculate value. And if Facebook in 10, 20, 30 years' time uh, make their currency to turn into money so that the users uh, consider this cryptocurrency as their own coin, that gives the power uh, to this company. And a state so big as the United States uh, cannot afford giving so much power to a company. So I think it's not a surprise that the Communist Chinese Party has told Alibaba and Jack Ma, look, you have developed this technology, but we now are going to decrease your power and use this technology for our own interest as state and for the common good of our state. And in the United States, as you know, the Biden administration is already saying that the power of the big technological American companies is too much, is excessive, and therefore they are trying to rearrange the power capabilities within the American capitalism where the state regains the power to control. I fully agree with this uh, approach, state, in times of crisis, regains power, generates trust for citizens, arranges the different tensions. But be that true, and I agree, and it's also convenient to give security and commonwealth for the whole uh, community of the citizens. But it is also true that I was speaking a bit more, uh, when I was speaking about Libra, that if you do not 
take the decision to do something, to ban someone else to do it, is not reasonable. I, I think central banks are already acting in this sense. Maybe they're going a bit too slow. I hope their decisions do not come late. But my comment was more in this sense. So while, and I think this is going to happen, while they do not issue, the central banks do not issue digital coins, euro, dollar, etc. So banning anyone else to move around until I do uh, my homework, then I don't think it's a good idea. And as Miguel Ángel Fernández Ordóñez said in an interview I read a few days ago, the problem is not doing it or not doing it. The problem is the speed, the moment, and how. We're at that moment right now. Well, the fact that the state is the first one launching a digital currency, uh, can, cha can that change the geopolitical or geofinancial equilibrium, balance, or not? Will the digital currency be a complement to the uh, physical currency? Well, I think there is an advantage by being the first one, but there's also the disadvantage of uh, having more risks than other uh, in, uh, stakeholders. Um, so by analyzing China, there are still doubts of the impact of issuing a digital coin, a full digital coin, especially if they let it work outside the country. We know China has capital control. You cannot uh, import or export money from China freely. So there are some restrictions, technical restrictions. There are some systemic risks uh, on how no, you introduce this technology, cybersecurity, etc. So even though we could say, yes, we're paying with mobile phones, so why do not already create this digital currency? I think it's a bit more complex, and we're seeing it in the reflections of the Central European Bank, which is saying that they're thinking to only be able to have 3,000 euro in this sovereign digital uh, euro deposit. Because if they let us have as many euros as we want, maybe we take away the money from our banks and put it in this sovereign euro digital account. And that's, that's bad for the banks. And in principle, this it's thought it should be designed to be as the cash. Not many people have more than 3,000 euro at home. You use it for your daily activities. But what we cannot do is to open a tab, and, so to say, and have a digital world where there is a competence against the, fi the banking system, which can unbalance our financial and monetary system. In this sense, as you said, Enrique, to what extent to be leaders in the issuing or the use of cryptocurrencies can be a determining factor in the current geopolitics? I think it is an element, important, innovative, of course. We're speaking about this in this virtual summit, many important people. But said this, we need to be relativized, because in geopolitics, the global analysis of international transactions, for that you need to analyze different factors, many important factors, with, for example, social, financial, economical, institutional, political factors. There is a whole package where this element, the cryptocurrencies, have entered this world, but I have also introduced some uncertainty, some darkness, but I wouldn't magnify, uh, amplify this, its importance. It is a piece, but the whole analysis is a bit more complex and wider than the single role that would give you to be the first one or to be the most relevant in issuing cryptocurrencies. We're all speaking about this here, but it's important, without a doubt. But I'm sure that in such a short time, two, three, four years' time, it will be integrated, it will be regulated, it will have an auxiliary um, role, but it will be one factor and not the determining one. I agree. I agree with what he has said. 
the money is a reflection of society, and then it reflects on the credibility and the value of the currency. So regardless how advanced your technology is, if the fundamental social pillars of your society are not solid, well, for example, China um, is still not, uh, their currency still has not an international presence so robust. The yen, for example, China, since 10 years' time, is already 10 times bigger than Japan. But that shows the weaknesses of China, because China, they need to be careful when it comes to interna internationalizing their or globalizing their coin because it uh, poses many risks. So, sorry, we have not more time for this debate. But, so, Rafael Catra, thank you very much. And Miguel Otero, thank you very much. Hope everything goes well with or without Bitcoins. I'm sure it will be with Bitcoins. Thank you. The debate was very interesting. Thanks to you all. El Bitcoin, no es Bitcoin is not money, it is rather a speculative asset. With this message we heard in this very interesting dialogue, we reached the final part of our second day in this summit. We are now going to listen to the five final reflections with which we will be closing our summit. It is a great satisfaction to have Carlos San Basilio, Secretary General of the Treasury and International Financing of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation at the Government of Spain. We greet again Paul Kendall, Lead Analyst and Digital Asset Markets at the Bank Santander. Mariona Vicente, Innovation and Digital Transformation Manager at Caixa Bank, and Álvaro de Salas, Strategy and Innovation Manager of Mainsight under the INRA Group. We would also like to welcome Adolf Esse, Commissioner of this Digital Coin and European Financial System Seville Virtual Summit, who will now have the floor. Good morning, my dear friends. Well, this is the end of a Loring Summit. Now, we are initiating this uh, closing ceremony, and insofar as a commissioner, I'd like to thank uh, the following colleagues uh, for their presence here. Panelists include Alvaro de Salas, who is Director of Strategy and Innovation, uh, say, but the, the Indra Group, representing a sponsor, also Maria Navitens, uh, Director of Innovation and Digital Transformation at uh, Caixa Bank, and Paul Kendall, Head of Analytics and Digital Assets and Markets at Santander, Spain, also uh, representing our sponsors. And finally, I would uh, especially like to thank in representation of the authority, Mr. Carlos San Basilio, Secretary General of the Treasury and International Finance at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation of the Government of Spain. Uh, who has accepted to uh, chair this closing ceremony. Thank you, Mr. San Basilio. Well, when uh, one reaches the end of an event, uh, it is a good time uh, to um, sum up and uh, take stock, not to mention to acknowledge uh, all the speakers, uh, all of the people who have participated uh, online with their presentations and contributions. And I would also like to thank one and all for these uh, intense uh, discussions and for extremely interesting uh, speeches. As for our sponsors, I would like to really acknowledge uh, them because uh, without their support, this would not have been possible. And it has not been easy 
to put together this summit because the market has not yet been consolidated. There are some doubts, uh, there are differences, uh, there is intention to try to uh, reach agreements, uh, but a uh, significant uh, commitment uh, was necessary to sponsor this summit. And uh, Caixa Bank, uh, first and foremost, uh, and uh, Santander, as well as Indra, have really done a huge effort uh, and their collaboration I truly appreciate. By way of conclusions, uh, there has been a, a plurality in uh, discussions and presentations. We've made uh, an effort to have uh, every single stakeholder represented. There's been clarity, transparency, and commitment. And we're satisfied for this. Uh, we've uh, realized that there are needs like a greater self-regulation across uh, all the players, basically all stakeholders in financial markets, uh, companies. The ecosystem is massive, and we need to really strive towards uh, self-regulation to avoid excessive regulation. Secondly, we need uh, to move swiftly as regards uh, European regulation because this uh, impacts uh, us specifically. Markets uh, are dispersed, there is uh, high volatility, and we need to set things in order and as quickly as possible. Thirdly, it is uh, clear that uh, Spain is uh, really emerging, as we've seen in these discussions and presentations. I think that Spain has a lot to say, and hopefully we will be able to regroup it to convey it this to the public authorities. Also, opportunities have uh, opened up. There is uh, a financial reconversion uh, that is uh, extremely deep and will go uh, really far. This is going to allow for an improvement in finance, uh, and uh, financing will be able to carry it out uh, in a more transparent, uh, cheaper, deeper way. Companies and citizens will benefit from this, not uh, to mention states and governments, if this is managed well, which we hope will be true. Financial digitization will give way to improvement because transactions will be easier and uh, the uh, extension, uh, the spread will be important and costs will be driven down. There is. Uh, a uh, real effort uh, to improve as regards uh, operational and financial technologies, uh, and uh, a lot is being done in digital uh, investment management. We have challenges in, because uh, the banking uh, sector is undergoing transformation, and there is a clear commitment uh, by Caixa Bank and Santander leading this uh, change uh, within the financial sector. And this this uh, gives us calm, peace of mind. Investment management uh, involves uh, a challenge. There are risks and opportunities, and striking a balance is not easy. Decision makers and managers uh, will have to fine-tune this. Small investors need to be tutored and protected by a regulation that is not here yet, but that will uh, come for sure. The geopolitical management of China, the US, the EU, there will be a significant uh, movement, uh, and uh, China's at the event guard, but the US and the EU are uh, trying uh, to move forward. We need uh, transparency and self-regulation. I think this needs to be very clear by way of conclusion. This is something that we all need to strive for, as for control, avoiding anti uh, uh, money laundering uh, is something that we need to take into account to struggle against uh, crime and in the security uh, discussion uh, we've heard that we have uh, anonymity on the one hand and privacy on the other, and we should not uh, confuse them. And in this uh, new world, the bad guys, so to speak, have no place. And finally, I think that we can draw some recommendations from this summit, including 
Number one, we need to be committed uh, to holding one such summit at least once a year so that we can all get together, all stakeholders can discuss together because this is not something that will be solved in months. Uh, we will need at least uh, five years of go comings and goings with uh, fine-tuning regulations. Uh, and it is an important moment in time to meet and uh, discuss what matters. Secondly, we need to draw the following conclusion. We need to make the most of the momentum of the summit to have a discussion cluster that brings together the relevant uh, market uh, stakeholders to discuss uh, what we need to discuss uh, with the uh, public authorities uh, to work towards uh, an appropriate regulation. And I think this cluster needs to happen soon to help us uh, in this undertaking. Finally, I believe uh, it is recommendable to publish uh, these uh, presentations uh, discussions. Uh, I think this would be a very powerful intellectual acqui, a, a collection of experiences and know-how to modernize our markets. So I would like to finish by thanking each and every person who's made this possible, including organizers, uh, technicians, interpreters, and everybody who has followed us uh, through the uh, media and social media networks. Thank you uh, for your participation. Our apologies should there be uh, small mistakes, and I hope to see you again next year. I would like to say goodbye. I would like to say thank you to all the participants in this closing session, and of course, thank you to those who attended the debates, the discussions, the speakers, and of course, special thanks to the city of Seville and its city council and the mayor, Mr. Espadas, for their support. I hope to see you next year in the second summit and hopefully in the city of Seville, a fantastic city too. I do hope this will be face to face because it's ever such a lovely city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Now we will listen to Álvaro de Salas, Strategy and Innovation Manager at Minsight under the INRA Group. First of all, I would like to say thank you to the event organizers for taking my insight into account and thank you too for inviting Grupo Indra to this very timely summit on digital currencies. We are honored, we have been honored to share panels with high statute professionals in their respective areas of business and activity over the past few days. Uh, variety of topics have been covered concerning CBDCs, uh, subjects that range from monetary policy or technology, including distributed re records and blockchain technologies or technology associated to security and cybersecurity to uh, regulation, among other subjects. The event has become an open window to the audience as uh, the topic has been addressed in a very clear way, the topic of CBDCs, a subject which to date in Spain had not been discussed by so many first-level private and public stakeholders. And after all the panels in the summit, and uh, although it was made clear that a great many challenges are still to be faced when a state uh, undertakes this huge uh, transformation, uh, transformation towards digital currencies uh, and having 
seen and listened to all interventions, some conclusions can be drawn. I would like to emphasize some of these conclusions. The first one is that CBDCs are an uh, unstoppable trend at a global level. They are here to stay. On the other hand, this trend, uh, possibly due to the trendy effect of the fear of missing out, possibly because of that, this trend will be further sped up. And I would say that in the next five, six years, the main economies in the world would have launched their own digital currencies. We also believe that another conclusion is that extreme CBDC models are not very likely to be sustainable and popular versus hybrid solutions as regards, you know, the level of decentralization or the use of both online and offline aspects or security. This aspect, security, the protection of citizens is essential without a doubt to the success of CBDCs. Similarly, CBDCs seem to be uh, still not operational and will not be operational since they are properly protected against cyber attacks and natural disasters, but uh, qualitative and quantitative limits will also be placed on the use of CBDCs to prevent them from being used as uh, haven or as a shelter and to prevent massive transfers from one currency to another currency. As part of those conclusions, um, I would also say that CBDCs, rather than contributing innovation, because a lot is said about innovation in CBDCs, but uh, current payment methods or payment means are already very innovative and disruptive. But in my view, CBDCs are to adapt and integrate with existing payment means, and they should do so in the easiest way possible. In sum, as the final conclusion, we could state that we are witness to the emergence of deep transformation in countries and their societies, which will cause uh, systems to be very different from what we know today. On my part, let me express my gratitude again. Thank you ever so much for everything. And of course, it was my pleasure. Thank you. We will now listen to Mariana Vicens, Innovation and Digital Transformation Manager at Caixa Bank. Good afternoon again, and thank you very much for being here. As you have seen during all the panels and interventions in this summit, the power of technology and the crypto world, the digital assets, is very promising. There, there are still challenges to be faced, but the power of the potential with this new technology that it represents is really wide. So we hope we can continue moving forward and take advantage of the opportunities and the value these represents for financial institutions and for the citizens in general. I would like to reiterate my um, greetings uh, to all the organizations 
and to all the speakers who were participating in this summit. In the closing of this summit, we will also have Paul Kendall, lead analyst in digital assets and markets at the Santander Bank in Spain. We will be listening to you. I am Paul Kendall, responsible of analysis and digital assets of the market area of Santander Bank. Before my intervention, I wanted to thank all the responsibles of the organization of this first edition of Digital Coin and European Financial System Summit. They made possible the realization of this summit. I also wanted to thank all the speakers, both in the presentations and in the round tables, because with their messages, they helped us understand better what we face, the new opportunities, and what's awaiting to all of us. This summit has allowed us to focus in two days the best experts of the digital active, something which is not very simple and uh, needs to be seen. The different sections have dealt with a wide topic from digitalization, the new European uh, monetary policy, and the way the new generations see the digital finances, and also speaking about the reactivation of uh, transactions throughout blockchain, and also how technology can help to transform the monetary market, importance of regulation for the sustainability of the new financial system, and the opportunities and risks of the new digital assets. Uh, all participants and the topics and also the format of this summit, which uh, fits perfectly with, with what has been spoken about, were essential to say that this uh, meeting has been a success. I'm speaking uh, both as a representative of Santander as, an, as, an, as a person, as responsible of analysis in Santander. It was a pleasure to hear the different opinions and point of views. It has has been enriching at professional level, and I hope I am now more prepared, prepared to face the future. It's something unknown that sometimes makes me uh, uh, that I need to clarify. I hope that we keep working in this direction. We have a big opportunity before of us, but also a great responsibility. The world is changing very fast, and we need to adapt and evolve with it. We cannot be left behind. It has been spoken in the different uh, interventions, and I want to highlight it. I hope this is the first one of many editions. I hope that we still can um, have new perspectives to the future, and I'm sure we will have new perspectives. And I hope that your feeling after this forum is as satisfactory as mine. I take home knowledge, a wider view, and also will to face the future. Once more, thank you very much for counting with the participation of Santander Bank in such an interesting project as this one. Congratulations and thank you very much. We now welcome in this closing, and especially thank for his participation, Carlos San Basilio, Secretary General of the Treasury and International Financing at the Ministry History of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation of the Spanish Government. Well, thank you very much. Indeed, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of this uh, meeting, to uh, Dolces especially for having us, uh, the Secretary General of Treasury and uh, the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation to address uh, a key issue as uh, is the digitization of the financial system, which is complex uh, and has huge implications. And uh, because of said uh, complexity, uh, there is a need for a deep knowledge, hence uh, this uh, forum is so important to hear what the different uh, stakeholders have to say. This is very important for us because as regulators, the digitization of the financial system gives way to challenges. Number one, time, because innovations happen very swiftly. In the financial system, we have uh, technology innovations that makes it difficult to adapt as quickly as uh, necessary the regulatory framework because it has uh, its own uh, timing and uh, guarantee needs. So this uh, time uh, challenge for regulations to adapt to innovations uh, comes along with another challenge uh, which uh, 
has to do with the following. As regulators, uh, we need to move around a thin line, which is facilitating technology innovations in the financial system to improve the quality in service delivery, improving the efficiency of uh, the whole system and economy as a whole. And uh, this uh, thrust has to be uh, compensated uh, uh, with uh, paying careful attention to two phenomena, protecting consumers and preserving financial stability. So we need to manage for uh, technology innovation and not uh, disrupt or hinder the uh, delivery of financial services and products. So we need to advance and be cautious. Uh, very uh, clearly. And how are we doing this? Well, uh, the financial sandbox uh, that we have uh, um, organized over the past months is a clear example. We have very specific uh, examples with uh, the participation of supervisors protecting uh, individuals. Uh, we needed to uh, give a boost uh, to innovations uh, and uh, in a context where we don't have a clear regulation. So these are control tests to learn as we go. We need to adapt uh, to the different uh, stakeholders uh, to measure the effect of innovations. And as you know, this sandbox process is advancing. We had the first call of the first 67 projects that were submitted. 18 have gone on to the first phase. The protocols are being developed on the basis of which the tests will be performed. And we're working on the next call which will happen probably after the summer. And hopefully, some of the projects that right now are not mature enough and will be able to uh, be uh, approved. It is an ongoing process. And this is for very specific projects and initiatives. What is important is to have a broad regulatory framework for, for example, uh, cryptocurrencies, which is on the rise, for this to be clearly regulated. This is for. Uh, all consumers and also for service uh, providers so that everybody knows uh, the rules of the game and for there not to be uh, unpleasant surprises in the future. So it's important to protect uh, users, but this is also a demand uh, coming from uh, service providers. So we're advancing to the best of our knowledge uh, towards uh, an EU regulation, which makes sense given our integrated uh, markets uh, in uh, the EU. And uh, uh, regulation, the MICA regulation is being um, discussed. Uh, and uh, the uh, Portuguese uh, presidency, whose uh, mandate uh, finishes in June, wishes to have this uh, ready. So some details are being uh, addressed. Uh, and probably this will happen either right before the summer or right after. Of course, then uh, we need to develop. We have the parliament, uh, the council, and the commission will set the final uh, text. And hopefully, in a reasonable uh, time, we will have this framework uh, that will uh, regulate uh, how cryptocurrencies uh, can be offered and used. Obviously, this uh, piece of regulation will take some time here in Spain, as with other countries, we've taken urgent measures using the fastest methods like uh, royal uh, uh, decrees uh, in Spain, by we have some control mechanisms on the advertising of uh, this kind of assets, which are generating some confusion in uh, uh, savers and uh, investors, and uh, in collaboration uh, with the Spanish authorities, who are uh, trying to shed light for there to be transparency in decision making. So this is part of what we're trying to do: regulating, supervising. Uh, crypto assets. But then you have also focused in this forum and at the ministry, we're following very closely 
has to do with the digital coins and very specifically public digital coins. In these two realms, we are witnessing advances uh, as regards digital coins. What we mentioned back in the day uh, still stands in larger countries, larger uh, markets, Spain, uh, France, uh, the Netherlands, uh, and uh, uh, Germany decided to have uh, some rules uh, to move forward because we need a, a regulatory framework. So this is what I was saying. Mika hopefully will allow for a regulatory framework so that these digital coins can uh, be managed uh, in, with a clear regulation. But these are uh, public uh, digital coins. You all know that central banks uh, across the globe are working on this. Uh, the European Central Bank is doing so. This is also true for other countries uh, outside the European uh, uh, Union. And we have even uh, we have ch the cases of China, uh, we have a uh, case of Finland uh, and the Economic uh, Union. They're advancing, they are undertaking in public consultations to really collect know-how and expertise and know how this digital euro uh, should be uh, shaped and deciding on what model we should follow. So. Uh, this is something that uh, us uh, countries who will be using uh, digital euros, not only using, uh, uh, but also issuing, uh, fully agree on. But this is an initiative that goes well beyond uh, methods of payment. It is a strategic initiative where, whereby the members uh, of the EU are working closely with the European Central Bank. And I would like to finish by underlining this twofold message with which I began. On the one hand, we have a clear need to take on the financial innovation challenges. This is true for supervisors and regulators, but this has got to be compatible with financial stability and protecting customers. We'll try to go as quickly as possible and striking a balance uh, between these two objectives because you cannot advance on one thing, on innovation, for example, if uh, this has a trade-off in consumer protection and financial stability. Thank you. Hoping that this summit will have more editions in the future, we will conclude this first digital coin, European Financial System Seville Virtual Summit, organized by Fibes Seville. We thank all of you for your attention and for your participation with the questions you sent to our speakers. We wish to congratulate more than 50 participants and speakers that represent all the different elements of this new financial system for their interesting contributions in this summit. We also thank the support of the global partners of this summit, Santander Bank, Caixa Bank and Minsight. The sponsors are Minsight and Payments and SIA, both companies of the Indra Group. Allow me to give a farewell with a message from the former President of the United States, Benjamin Franklin. An investment in knowledge pays the best interest. We are sure that with all the information, analysis that we've had throughout this summit, we've all made a great and fruitful investment. It's been a pleasure to be with you and we hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much.